Perfect. Now I don't pick here. Yeah. I think uh, you disappeared. Um, you are mute now. Uh, do you want that I show you in presentation? Okay. Sorry, say again, Giovanni. I, I, say, I ask you, do you want that I show you my presentation if it's working or? or... Yes. Yes? Yes, please. Yes, please. I will immediately. Eka, Kaspar. Just want to say I have to bail out in a few minutes for 15 minutes and uh, join another Zoom meeting, but I will be no back problem. right afterwards. Okay. So at the bottom, there should be green. Uh, button share screen uh, and then you need to hit another share screen on a smaller one yeah then you need to choose the window you want to share uh, wait 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 and make a mistake okay so it's okay Perfect. You're sharing the right window. That's okay. good. Okay, okay. so, so that's be, fine. When you will can, be my, now, my time, I, I will do it. Perfect. You can stop sharing now. There should yes. be a red button at the top. Yes. Stop sharing. Okay. Perfect. Eka, do you want to do the same thing? Sorry? We'll yeah. ask um, Eka to do the same thing, and then we're ready to okay. go. Okay, okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Because otherwise it's, it's, it's making a lot of noise. Perfect. Okay, Eka sharing, very good. Eka, can you just unshare now? Stop sharing? Yep, I do. Okay, I think we're nearly ready to, to start. So I think we stop sharing now. Yeah. And Where is Victor? He's still oh, in yeah, Victor, Victor yeah. he's waiting for the link I asked Sanjeev to send him. The link, uh, he, he should have got the, his personal link. Yeah. Uh, you all probably received one, one hour ago. Yeah. He, he has another like he link. It, he just sent me an email. Because he needed he one more time. He missed it. Yeah, he thanked uh, for, for your email, Imad, on Hakuma. Yeah. So I think we'll have to then uh, improvise with, with his entrance. Uh, so what I suggest we do when uh, Victor is about to start, he would just do it. Hopefully it will work. And either Sanjeev or Pablo, whoever will have the button then, will help him uh, to do it in case he gets stuck. Is that okay? Yeah. Rather than seven people trying to advise him what to do. <laughs> You mean about Victor stuff? Well, Victor will hopefully know how to start sharing, you know, straight away without any problems. But in case he gets stuck. No, I, I'm going to fix it now. The thing is that you will receive a personal link. So once you enter your personal link, you appear with your name. If I send him another link, for example, mine, he will appear like Pablo there. No, no, what I mean is once he's, once he's joined the conference. Yeah. Um, and he wants to then give his presentation and share his screen. Hopefully he will know how to do it. But in case he gets stuck, we it will be either it. you or Sanjeev navigating him rather, you know, 12 of us trying to tell him what to do at the same time. No worries. Yeah. Right. And uh, should it not work, then uh, Ramesh, you are on, 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 on rotation. Ramesh. So what is it? No, Ramesh. No, I, I mean that if uh, Victor will not work, then Ramesh is going to give the lecture, but he's only smiling, the guy there. <laughs> <laughs> Ramesh Kerolos, you mean? Uh, yeah, I mean Ramesh, yeah. yeah. 
Ramesh. Ramesh. Oh, Ramesh. yes. Yeah, yeah, Ramesh is unmuted now. Yeah, can, I, can, I correct, yeah. can, can I correct a little misunderstanding? So this guy we're looking at is Ramesh, uh, Ramesh and and uh, the other guy who talked <laughs> yesterday is Ramesh. Yeah? <laughs> you all know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Only Ramesh is calling calling Ramesh Ramesh. <laughs> <laughs> Fundamentally the same name, yeah. I suppose. Okay. Eventually. Yeah. Okay, I think we're nearly nearly uh, at um, the beginning of our so uh, Vladimir, you, you will kind of introduce us a little bit and then I'll introduce the first speaker, yeah? Okay. Perfect. I, I shall greet them and you will introduce the first speaker, am I right? Perfect. Perfect. And Tom, you will take over till my lecture. You will introduce myself, and after that, I will be introducing. Um, Tom, Tom, yeah. can we discuss timings, Tom? Because Ramesh has just texted me, and I think he's busy as well. And the easiest way, is just so not too many people are speaking, is if you, if you run the timings as well. Okay. Because it worked well for us yesterday. Otherwise, okay, uh, fine. Fine. Be cutting in, I think. Okay. Yeah. So but uh, case, yeah, one minute to go. Tom. Yeah. I can help you with the question and answer for the first half. I think to avoid confusion, two moderator, one is checking the timing and one is okay, checking fine. the then, question and answer yeah, and make okay. it easy for the whole. And, Here and is, the, we have, uh, uh, Victor is with us. Okay, Perfect. I think we are probably ready to start now. Or should we check Victor? I'm gonna change his name. <laughs> Better. Yeah, because you see, he confused us with the uh, double. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> Try Ramesh. It's 2 p.m., gentlemen. Yeah. Can we start? Yeah. Yep. Hello, Victor. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good night for those in Vanuatu. And I hope you will enjoy the, today's program as much as you did uh, yesterday. There was a great, great number of uh, participants and uh, we really enjoyed that very much. And I hope you did enjoy it as well. And uh, to save time, I just hand over to Tom Santarius, who is going to introduce the first lecturer. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, we were all introduced yesterday, so we won't be doing any major introductions. Um, the first speaker will be Professor Daniel um, Roy Daniel, um, who is um, currently in Geneva, uh, is a professor of vice chairman, as you can see on the slide, um, originally from Keller, uh, with a main interest in skull base and vascular surgery, but a major uh, past clinical interest as well as research interest in neurosciences related to um, epilepsy surgery, and he'll be talking about this subject now. Roy, thank you, uh, you. Thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, I'll just go on straight to my presentation. Uh, we'll be speaking to you on the white matter anatomy in epilepsy surgery. So essentially dealing with pediatric epilepsy surgery and that too disconnective surgery and concentrating on the white matter anatomy. So there will not be much physiology or surgical details in this presentation. So what are the, just to give a brief outline, what are the goals of epilepsy surgery? The main idea is to eliminate seizures, but because we're doing this predominantly in children, what happens is that they are allowed to develop properly cognitive functions and other functions. And at the same time, we should make sure that there are no new neurological deficits. So what it achieves is that you can reintegrate these children into society. So if, to put it simplistically, you have uh, one hemisphere or part of a hemisphere completely destroyed by the epileptic disease. So you want to completely destroy this hemisphere, which is already destroyed, but you want to completely disconnect it so that uh, that cannot propagate epilepsy. But what it effectively does is that the other hemisphere develops and into a double hemisphere. So all the cognitive functions and general functions develop in the normal, the good hemisphere. So that's essentially the idea of this uh, surgery. So there are several techniques for epilepsy surgery. The simple ones are the lesionectomy and lobectomy. Uh, but then you have all these disconnective techniques that's lobotomy, quadrantotomy, hemispherotomy, interhemispheric disconnection, and then some special applications for VNS and radiosurgery. 
But this uh, lecture is primarily uh, dedicated to anatomy and therefore disconnective epilepsy surgery, which includes lobotomy, quadrantotomy, and larger uh, disconnective surgeries. So that's what we're focusing on. This presentation is based on the five principal publications that we have done uh, with the description of these techniques. So just to put it into perspective, we are talking of the prefrontal lobotomy, the anterior quadrantotomy, the posterior quadrantotomy, and then hemispherotomy, which is one whole hemisphere. And then for uh, disconnecting between the two hemispheres, which is the total commissurotomy. So these papers will give you the details of the physiology and uh, the clinical details and the microsurgical details. I will not be talking on that in this presentation, but you could go back to these papers to look at the, look at the details of the surgery. So what is hemispherotomy? Hemispherotomy is done when one whole hemisphere is completely uh, destroyed by the disease. And therefore, what you want to do is uh, a radical hemispheric tractotomy. So you section the internal capsule in its entire uh, length, and then from inside the ventricle, you completely disconnect the corpus callosum from inside, and then you go and disconnect the fornix to deafferent the temporal lobe. And then there are some parts of the frontal lobe that need to be addressed through a frontobasal disconnection because there are some connections through the commissure, anterior commissure that are residual. So this effectively deafferents the entire hemisphere and uh, uh, achieves uh, uh, a cessation of seizures in more than 90% of patients. So let's go to the cadaveric white mid uh, dissection study that we uh, performed in uh, Pablo Gonzalez lab in Alicante, Spain. Uh, and just to show you the anatomy because that's the focus of this talk. So the uh, anterior quadrant is the lobe which is anterior to the primary motor strip as you can see here. So that's the central sulcus and then everything from the pre-motor to all the whole prefrontal lobe is the anterior quadrant. So these are children who have a normal motor function and all function in these lobes intact, but this lobe, the frontal lobe anterior to the pre-central sulcus is, uh, is diseased. And so it uh, involves a disconnection of that lobe. As you can see here, the F1, F2, and F3 on the cortical surface. And if you look at this lobe medially, you will see the, the genu of the corpus callosum, the rostrum, and the body. And then you have the, para, uh, you have the cingulate uh, sulcus here, the subcallosal sulcus, and the gyrus rectus you can see here. And if you look at it from the basal view, and this is an interesting view, and you see these sulci here, you see these three the sulci here that divide the basal frontal lobe into four. So you have the anterior and the posterior, the medial and lateral fronto orbital gyri. And the, and the anatomy of these gyri are very important to make sure that uh, the mesial and basal frontal lobes are disconnected. So as you go deeper in the disconnection, you first remove from the lateral surface, you remove all the gray matter. And that shows you the short association fibers, which are called the U fibers, that connect uh, adjoining gyri that can be seen in this, uh, this uh, section. And then as you go deeper, when you remove the U fibers, you see the first long association fibers, the most dorsal part, which is the SLF, superior longitudinal fasciculus, and that too only the top part of it, the SLF1. And that you can find approximately uh, just deep to the middle frontal gyrus. So the middle frontal gyrus is here, just deep to that you have the dorsal part of the SLF, which is the SLF1. And then you go ahead and remove that, you start seeing the extreme capsule. Uh, and once if, to see that, you need to remove a part of the lobe here, which also shows you the, the, uh, the insula. So the extreme capsule is, uh, is basically a series of fibers that connect the insula uh, to the operculum, essentially all around, and they form the extreme capsule. So as you go deeper to that, you will start seeing the external capsule. And then we proceed with the disconnection, uh, with the dissections, and you start removing those structures. You see very important tracks here. One is the external capsule. As you start removing it, you start seeing the uncinate fasciculus and the IFOF. Uh, uh, frontooccipital, inferior frontooccipital uh, fasciculus, so which connects 
the frontal lobe with uh, a large stream of connections to the posterior part of the brain, and the uncinate fasciculus, which connects the inferior part of the frontal lobe, the frontal pole, with the temporal pole and some fibers to the amygdala. So these are the structures you would see as soon as you do the dissection there. And as you go deeper, you'll when you remove part of the IFF and the uncinate fasciculus, you'll start seeing the frontopontine fibers, which are part of the anterior part of the internal capsule. And you can see its relation up to the putamen here. You remove part of it, it's composed, the internal capsule, the anterior part has three components. So the most lateral, it's organized lateral to medial. The most lateral part is the frontopontine fibers. And then just medial to that, you have an ascending system. So frontopontine is descending. And just medial to that, you have the thalamocortical, so from the anterior thalamic nuclei to the prefrontal lobe, which is ascending. And then you, you start removing it, you see the third component, which is the frontostriatal fibers. They are from the frontal lobe to the striatum. So these are the three fibers. And when you remove a little bit of the frontostriatal fibers, you, you see the blue structure, which is the ependyma of the ventricle. So these are sequential dissections that show you the anatomy of the region. If you want to see all three components together of the internal capsule, this magnified slice shows you the, that's the frontopontine, and then you have the thalamocortical fibers, which have been sectioned partly here. You can see the cross section here, which allows you to see the frontostriatal. Now, note the disconnection. It, it goes curvilinear there, and that's to avoid getting into the anterior part of the putamen and the caudate nucleus. So it has to go, when you cut the internal capsule, it has to be cut in a curvilinear manner. And then as it goes below the disconnection onto the frontobasal disconnection, you'll be effectively interrupting the IFOF and the uncinated fasciculus. So uh, these, are, these are views that show you the transition of the corona radiator and the internal capsule that you see there. And again, note the curvilinear manner in which uh, you do the uh, section of the internal capsule. Now this incision is made here to cut essentially the SLF and all the fibers that start from the front lobe and go posteriorly to the central, to the parietal and the occipital lobe. Now, once you've done the entire section of the internal capsule, what you see will be inside the ventricle. And then in the ventricle, if you look at the roof of the ventricle, you'll see the corpus callosum, the body of the corpus callosum, for instance. So this is just to show you the inside of the ventricle. So imagine that the corona radiator or internal capsule is completely cut. That's why you're seeing the ventricle. And then inside the ventricle, you will do in a parasagittal plane, the callosotomy. Now you can compare that to the medial view that kind of describes that. That's where the callosum is done. And the callosotomy is performed in this direction for the body, the genu, and the rostrum. So that is, allows you to disconnect the frontal lobe uh, uh, almost completely. The only part that's left is the connections of the anterior commissure. Now the anterior commissure is, uh, is a very interesting uh, uh, anatomical structure. It has got two limbs. It's got the posterior limb and the anterior limb. The anterior limb, it, it connects uh, essentially this cortex, the, the frontal basal cortex, uh, and the posterior limb actually goes behind uh, the, into, the, into the temporal horn and goes even more posterior. So these two uh, structures, the, the an anterior commissure is disconnected here as part of the frontobasal disconnection, and that completes the entire disconnection of uh, the, the cortex, uh, the frontal lobe essentially. Now this is a very interesting view, and it's, but it's a little more difficult to understand because this is the base of the brain, but a lot of part of the base of the brain has been removed. So as in, and you remove it so that you can see the inside the ventricle. So that's the body of the corpus callosum that you see in the depth there. So there's a cavity of the ventricle here. That shows you the relationship with the anterior commissure, which is very superficial in this case. And this is where that needs to be cut, as you can see here to disconnect the basal and mesial parts of the frontal lobe. So to make it in a schematic view, this is the surgery. You do the intrafrontal disconnection that disconnects the frontal from all the other lobes. And then you go inside the ventricle, the corpus callosum is cut, and then you come down and you disconnect the anterior commissure that completely dis uh, disconnects the anterior frontal lobe. So uh, a slight variation of this with some differences in the anatomy that we had recently published is the prefrontal lobotomy. 
So the prefrontal lobotomy is unilateral, it's not bilateral, and that was only done many years back for, uh, for a psychiatric disease, but this is for epilepsy and it's unilateral, so we don't expect any psychiatric changes in these patients because the, that prefrontal lobe is already diseased and is not having any useful function. So in this one, it's very similar to the anterior quadrant autotomy, but there's some anatomical things that could be interesting. Just to show you its bony relationship, that's a superior temporal line, that's the T rion there. A small craniotomy, which is an extension of a T rional craniotomy, if you will, which is more frontal and had no temporal. It gives you exposure of the, the top of the sylvian fissure and the middle and the inferior and the middle frontal guy, right? The, this is the disconnection plane. So, what needs to be seen here in this uh, prefrontal lobotomy is to see the gyri of the frontal operculum. That's the uh, the pars orbitalis, pars uh, triangularis, and pars opercularis. So, it it is between these two, the last two, that we start making the disconnection. In the depth, in the basal surface, we already described the basal gyri of the frontal lobe. On the mesial surface, you can see that the body of the corpus callosum is not cut. It's only the anterior part, the rostrum, and the genu, which is cut in this operation. Quickly run you through the fiber. Again, U fibers we already described. You see the dorsal SLF that comes there. The corona, as when you remove that, you see the corona radiator and its transition with uh, the putamen, and you see the IFOF the uncinate vesicle, and if you keep removing that and part of the putamen, you would even see the arterial commission. So, and uh, I think this slide shows you the anterior commissure with respect to the transition of the coronary radiator internal capsule. The putamen has partly been moved aside and the inferior frontal lobe has been removed a little bit because this represents the limit of the frontobasal disconnection. So from a mesial side, the frontobasal disconnection, again, you see this is only the rostrum and the genu that is disconnected. And here you see how we have to go across the uh, olfactory tract and see the gyrus rectus to make sure that the mesial frontal lobe is completely disconnected. So this is just a view to show you inside the ventricle, the difference between getting the cutting the corpus, uh, the corona radiator, and uh, cutting the corpus callosum. It's in the roof of the ventricle, the corpus callosum, and that needs to be sectioned to achieve disconnection from the other hemisphere. So the, that was for the prefrontal and anterior frontal, uh, anterior quadrant, but then what do you do when you have uh, children with epilepsy that comes from both hemispheres? So this was a large series that we published with work done with uh, Professor Sufyanov in uh, in Tumen, Russia. So these were essentially all patients there. And then we did also a series of disconnections, which I'm going to focus on. So we're trying to disconnect one hemisphere from the other. So we are not deafferenting the hemisphere. It's only the, it's a commissural disconnection only. So here, the series of uh, disconnections that we did give rise to, dissections that we did give rise to some interesting images. And Henry showed part of it yesterday, but it's important to realize that the patient is positioned with the head turned completely. And so it's not the usual position for a ventricular cisternostomy. So that head is turned completely and you go orthogonal to the, to the brain surface, and then you reach the ventricle. And then we are using flexible endoscopes. So, which gives you this view. And this view is only possible, don't imagine like a ventricular cisternostomy. This is a view of a flexible endoscope that is inside the ventricle. So imagine you're standing inside the ventricle and looking forwards. So when you look forwards, what you see is the two foramen of Monroe, the carotid plexus you can see there, and you have these two large uh, columns of the phonics. And between the two forming uh, almost equilateral triangle is the anterior commission. And then as you go, as you look inferior, you will see the lamina terminalis, and then you will see the optic chiasma here, and the infundibular recess. So this is a view from inside the ventricle with a flexible scope. Now, if you just turn around, you move the flexible scope posteriorly. So you're standing inside the ventricle and you're looking posteriorly, you see these uh, incredible images uh, of the posterior commissure. And then you see the suprapineal recess here, uh, sorry, the pineal recess here and the suprapineal recess here. So the pineal recess is bordered superiorly by the habinular commissure and inferiorly by the posterior commissure. And above the hamilunar commissure, you get the suprapineal recess, and there you start seeing the choroid plexus of the 
uh, roof of the third ventricle. So the velum interpositum and the roof of the third ventricle and it continues uh, anteriorly. And then as you go uh, inferiorly, you'll start seeing the anterior, uh, sorry, the aqueduct of silva. So this is the image from inside the ventricle. And this was just dissections to show again, reinforce the idea of the anterior commissure. And you see the anterior limb there and the posterior limb there. And you see it, the structure that's parallel to the optic chiasma. And those are the mammary bodies. So this is a view from the basal surface of the brain. And then you, our dissections led us to completely uh, follow these fibers all around, all the way here. And this shows you, for instance, in violet, the connections of the anterior commissure with parts of the temporal nerve. So just to show that this is not just one structure there, it, it connects the entire hemisphere almost. Uh, so a view from the midline. Now this is a more familiar view for everybody in neurosurgery. So where are the anterior and posterior commissure? So this is the anterior commissure and this is the posterior commissure. And this is the hypothalamic sulcus, which divides the hypothalamus from the hypothalamus here from the thalamus there. And then you see the site of the fornix. Then you see how the corpus callosum, the rostrum of the corpus callosum almost completely blends into the anterior commissure. And there, inferior to that, you see the wall, anterior wall of the third ventricle, which is the lamina terminalis. And then you get the infundibular recess here and the optic recess here, these two. And then as you go posteriorly, you see the mammary body, the posterior perforated substance, the tegmentum of the midbrain, and the tectum. So this is an oblique view that kind of shows almost the same structures, but again, anterior commissure, and the posterior commissure, and the habitular commissure here. So quickly run you through a video. I hope I have enough time. This is the video just to show you this anatomy, which is so unusual to see. Now this, we are going through one foramen of Monroe and going to the next one. And so there, as you go inside, you will see the anterior commission. So there, this fiber tract here, which is between the two foramen of Monroe is the anterior commission. So that's the section of the anterior commission. Run the video a little more posteriorly and you turn it around and you come across to the posterior commissure. That's the, that's the posterior commissure. What you saw before was the roof of the third ventricle. Again, that's the posterior commissure. Then inside the lateral ventricle, you use the rigid scope and you, that's the corpus callosum. That's the roof of the lateral ventricle and you slowly disconnect the entire corpus callosum from anterior to posterior. You can cut with this uh, monopolar or bipolar and then progressively disconnect the entire corpus callosum in a parasagittal plane. See, that's the method of uh, disconnection of the uh, corpus callosum. Um, so what did we do for the posterior quadrant? I'll quickly run through that, but essentially the posterior quadrant to dissect it and to understand it and to operate here, we need to understand the telencephalic flexion. So the embryology is fascinating here. It's essentially the, I want to focus on the development of the telencephalon. And these flexures you can uh, see here, but the telencephalon starts developing disproportionately proportionate to the rest of the brain. So it's not always the case. Huh? We look at the telencephalon in rats, it's almost straight in sheep as well. There's a small turn. And then you see in primates that it just takes a bigger turn and in humans it's completely turned here. What's fascinating to realize is that when it started off the telencephalon, the frontal lobe was anterior and the temporal lobe was posterior and the peritoxpital was somewhere in between. But as we started uh, developing the flexure, what happened is that at the end of the game, the temporal lobe became very anterior. So it started off as a very posterior structure and ended up with a relatively anterior location. And what was not posterior before, which is the occipital lobe, is now firmly posterior. So we, during the COVID crisis, we had a, a lot of time, me and Pablo, so Pablo did some fantastic dissections of the posterior quadrant in Alicante that shows you the U fibers here and it shows you from the medial surface the relationship of the splenium and the isthmus here, which is found at the junction of the parahippocapal gyrus, the lingula, and uh, the cingulum that has been removed in this case. And what is essential is to realize these two points here, which is the post crural point where the two fornix almost joins and touches the corpus callosum and the retro hippocampal point there. And once we understand the anatomy of these two points, we can understand a lot about the telencephalic flexure. 
So in, in conclusion, I just quickly described to you the anatomy, white matter anatomy of the hemispherotomy, which is the whole hemisphere, as it, and it needs to be completely disconnected from the entire hemisphere. A small part, if you want to do, of the prefrontal lobe, and then the anterior quadrantotomy, which is almost the entire frontal lobe, the posterior quadrantotomy, which disconnects the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes. Uh, this work is, a lot of it is done in different places, Alicante, uh, Tumen, uh, and Switzerland. The Zoom experience has been uh, great, uh, but we sorely miss the other activities of the Neuroanatomy Committee, and I hope we can restart that soon. Thank you. Roy, thank you very much for your, for your great talk. It's amazing how much you managed to cover in, in such a relatively short period of uh, time. Uh, while uh, the next speaker is is getting ready, um, can uh, can uh, we have several questions here? Um, in fact, the first one was from uh, Francisco Alberto Viegas Lopez. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. How to avoid damage to thalamus in frontal lobectomy? Roy, could you uh, could you tell us? Well, in frontal lobectomy, uh, I think it's essentially the re realization of when you enter into the uh, ventricle. So once you, you disconnect uh, frontal lobectomy for epilepsy or for any other disease, once you cut the internal capsule or the corona radiator internal capsule junction and you enter the ventricle, after that, you have to follow the, uh, you will be immediately, you will see the intraventricular structures, the caudate nucleus in front and the thalamus more posterior. Uh, so at that point, it's, uh, after that, it's difficult to injure it. So as long as you stay uh, oriented by the intraventricular anatomy, thalamic injury should not occur. And um, another question was related to vision, um, where I suppose you could paraphrase the question, you know, where and, um, in which operational vision is at risk and what steps do you take? How do you think of the operation in order to avoid uh, damage to vision? Well, the, uh, if you're talking about epilepsy surgery per se, and especially pediatric epilepsy surgery, uh, the lobes that we're disconnecting do not have any function. So even if there is on very um, detailed and uh, minute testing uh, the, uh, the visual fields or the sensitivity between the fields, you might get some deficits. Uh, they are rarely symptomatic because these children uh, kind of adapt and uh, the visual cortices of the other hemisphere kind of subserve almost the entire field. So it is, ne it is never a problem when you are contemplating pediatric epilepsy surgery because these are all diseases that occur in utero during early part of development of the brain. So the visual cortex has, a, like all cortices, have a remarkable capacity to adjust. The only cortex which does not have a capacity to adjust is the motor strip, the motor cortex. And that, and that becomes predominantly um, relevant uh, in, uh, for the movement of the distal extremities. So essentially movement of the hands or movements of the foot tapping. So these are the only function that uh, that we lose if it already existed. But these people <coughs> who have hemiplegias for whom we look at doing a hemispherotomy, they don't have any distal motor function, so you lose nothing. But if it is there and you were to do a, a disconnection of that lobe, you will lose it, but that's the rarity. There's been lots of uh, notes of appreciation and lots of other questions, but we don't really have time to entertain all of them. Uh, Roy, do you mind um, stop sharing your presentation with us and um, we will have uh, the next speaker, which is um, Professor Igor Maldonado, um, share his presentation with us. And while Igor is doing it, which are nearly there, I'd like to say that for those who don't uh, know Igor, he is originally from Brazil, um, works in Tours in France. Um, he is an excellent uh, neurosurgeon in the old sense, but also uh, very clever with his hands uh, with wires and tubes, 
i.e. endovascular surgeon, but also an expert uh, radiologist. And I think this is a perfect mix uh, for a person to tell us about uh, cerebrovascular anatomy. Igor, are you there? Are you hearing? You can hear fine. Um, try to be as close to the uh, microphone as you can be. There's a bit of echo. Okay, is better now? So thank you, thank you, Tom, and thank you all guys for this fantastic experience. So um, many, oh, oh, many of you remember uh, the contributions of uh, Egas Muniz to the de development of uh, cerebral angiography in the beginning of last century. At that time, cerebral geography was performed by direct puncture of the carotid artery uh, without any kind of subtraction. Uh, this guy uh, shared the Nobel Prize for development of a frontal lipotomy, as you see here. It was one of the most controversial Nobel Prize ever awarded. Of course, he could have won the prize years before uh, because of his contributions in detecting uh, intracranial pathologies using cerebral geography. At the present days, of course, we rarely perform a direct carotid puncture. Uh, we employ mostly a femoral approach. Uh, the operator certificates that is inside the lumen of the, uh, of the artery, not the vein. And then with the help of a guide wire, the needle is replaced by the sheet, as you see here. And once the sheet is in place, the operator can introduce the angiographic catheter and navigate in the rest. Until the neck, or intracranial space, uh, mainly through the carotid or vertebral arteries. The catheter progression is followed in the angio feet, the vessels are opacified, and then you get uh, two dimensional images such as this one or this one very amplified with bone subtraction. So, one of the first important concepts and the vascularization of the cephalon is the fact that it's organized in two connect systems. One is the anterior or uh, connect uh, anterior carotid system. And the other is um, the vertebral basilar uh, system. Uh, and both are connected by uh, the polygon of Willis, which is also described as the arteral cycle of the brain. So uh, the vascularization of the encephalon derives from the arch to arch, which presents certain number of variations. Some of them are quite rare, other or relatively common and we see times to times. And, and some of them are, can be real, really a challenge for catheterization. So this, the first one you see here is the general pattern. So um, some other relative common, as you see here, as in uh, the uh, left primitive or common carotid artery that is emerging quite close to the uh, brachiocephalic trunk or even together or um, a vertebral artery that emerges directly from the crossa, from the arch, or, uh, arch completely detached from the subic bladder. And this is one more rare, but we can see time to time when we do a lot of angiography, you see that the, the right subic or artery is coming completely distal to all those, all those uh, large vessels. Here we see an image of arteriography and uh, you see all, once again the most common presentations. In the angiogram, we recognize uh, the nonmate artery, so the TABC, uh, the emergence of the vertebral artery just uh, proximal at the level of the superior aspect of the subclavian, uh, just before the internal thoracic uh, artery. You see the primitive or uh, common, left common uh, carotid artery, the left subclavian, and the, uh, the vertebral. So, in a young subject, the ICA generally takes uh, a position which is posterior in relation to the, to the external web. It's of course also is slightly lateral and then comes medial as it uh, comes to enter the carotid canal. In the young person, it's better to distinguish left and right uh, carotid in lateral view. And then uh, as the anatomy changes with age and vessels get elongated. The bifurcation tends in most people to get coronalized and then the AP view often becomes uh, better in elderly people. Uh, we recognize then also the uh, internal carotid daughter by the presence of the carotid bulb, which is uh, uh, 
a very important physiological site for bioreception, and then for by the fact that and almost every case we have no branches for internal carotid artery. Uh, quite rarely, uh, I think maybe I saw only once. You can have an ascending pharyngeum coming from the uh, from the internal carotid artery, but it's really exceptional. And then at the level of external carotid, you recognize the branches in the usual order, such as the uh, superior thyroidal, uh, facial, lingual, and then you see the posterior spec to the occipital artery. The carotid bulb is a site for change of velocity of flow and also is a, is a site of uh, low stress. So it's a uh, uh, a vascular site that is prone to atherosclerosis and thus atherosclerosis stenosis, as uh, you see here. As the ICA penetrates in the school, uh, it presents several segments that uh, must be recognized. There are different ways to classify them. The different classifications were proposed. I am not going to show all of them in this lecture. It is a, a knowledge that is still evolving. Uh, these are the classifications that are accepted in most centers, but you know it's a quite variable from one place to the other. As soon as the ICA penetrates in the corrupted canal, you have uh, you have uh, the petrol segment, and uh, you may also talk about the lateral or precavernal segment. And then when it enters the cavernal sinus, it curves to ice, and you have this horizontal and vertical portion inside the cavernal sinus. And then the anterior clenoid is here, and you have this supraclenoid portion. So the carotid artery is getting inside the subarachnoid space and is getting uh, also trigeminal, trigeminal innervation. Uh, this uh, fissure classification is very well accepted in the radiological domain. So you see the segments are numbered uh, against the direction of the flow uh, from uh, distal to proximal. And so we recognize here the anterior choroidal artery, the posterior communicating artery. So everything is superior to the proximal ostium of the posterior communicating artery. It's called C1, C2 corresponds to the ophthalmic segment. And then you have C3, C4 for the vertical and horizontal portion of the uh, infracavernal skeleton. And C5, you have a precavernous segment. So uh, I think that the best way to deal with different classifications to, to use um, not only numbers, but also vernacular classification. So every time we should describe it, we should use uh, terms to describe it. Gibo and Bichelier are more uh, recent classifications, which are quite different. You see that the segments are numbered in the direction of the flow. They do not correspond perfectly. Interestingly, in, in the Bichelier classification, you have a small segment for, uh, for the clinoidal portion. And uh, uh, something that is uh, important is that for more precise classification of this subarachnoid portion, subarachnoid segments, there is a subdivision which is generally used. You see maybe here in this publication from uh, Professor Rotton's uh, group, we can refer to an ophthalmic and, and communicating and a choroidal segment. The ophthalmic segment comes from the emergence of the ophthalmic artery which is usual uh, classical landmark for the roof of the curtain of sinus. So from the proximal ostium of the ophthalmic artery to the proximal ostium just before the, the emergence of the communicating artery, then we can talk about a communicating segment from the proximal emergency of the communicating artery, posterior communicating artery, uh, just before to the anterior choroidal, then the choroidal segment, and finally the, the carotid bifurcation. Well, that's what we uh, we see in this angiogram, lateral view. We can recognize those uh, segments. So uh, ophthalmic, communicating, and, uh, and choroidal. So note these uh, aspects and change of diameter of the posterior communicating uh, artery. It's very classic. And when the wind is polygon and was well formed, you see uh, the point in which contrast gets out of the posterior communicating artery and gets into the two segments of the posterior cerebral artery. And you see there is some contrast washing, uh, washing here and then the very, uh, very uh, typical bifurcation of the, uh, of the PCA. And then for the uh, anterior choroidal artery, you see it's much more, uh, much smaller, much thinner. And you have this uh, typical ascendant 
trajectory as is going to get uh, very close to the base of the brain, very close to the uh, optic tract, and you have very teeny small branches that will uh, work as perforators, and some of them are very important to, as you know, to the uh, posterior limb of the um, of the internal capsule. So, um, this also in this angiogram, we can see some tiny, very uh, tiny vessels that we don't see uh, in every angiogram. Some of them are uh, uh, very variable, and so they are in neurological remains, such as the Banibulo Vigen, but we, we can also have some tympanic branch or stapedius artery. But the important ones are those that are coming from the cavernal segments, such as infralateral trunk and meningeal hypophysial trunk. So this is uh, the most common pattern. The minimal hypophysial trunk gives some long branches to the tertiary and the dura of the uh, of the clavicle, such as the medial clavicle branch, as you, you see here. And the infralateral trunk gives branches to uh, also to the clavicle. You have a small lateral clavicle artery, but also branches to uh, foramen of the slow base. And often you have uh, anastomosis with uh, the uh, ophthalmic artery. So two branches I would like to detail for the inferolateral tract were quite interesting, or this, uh, those two here, the basal tutorial artery and the marginal tutorial artery. Those are, as I mentioned, the branches that we don't see every time in angiograms, but they may be enlarged when you have uh, some slow based pathology, such as tumor, AVM, or fistula, such as this case of a, a, a arteriovenous fistula of the uh, transverse sinus. So typically, they come from the intracavernous portion, horizontal portion, and they have this small tortuosities, and the trajectory is roughly posterior and, uh, and superior. Uh, so we have this clinical, um, this typical inclination, and it's very difficult in a lateral view to be sure which one is the basal tentorial uh, artery, which one is the marginal tentorial artery, which is at the level of the free edge of the tentorial. But when you uh, take a look at the AP view, it becomes really easy because you see that the marginal tutorial branch is also known as your artery of Bernasconi Cassinari, draws for us the free border of the tutorial, as you see here, which is, will be not, never the case for the uh, basal tutorial branch. So, um, in this uh, in this view, we can recognize uh, the uh, the ophthalmic the ophthalmic artery. As you see here, as I mentioned, is a classical landmark from the roof of the um, of the carnal cavernal sinus. Something important that in later phase we can see the colloid uh, blush that is spilling from the uh, from the ophthalmic artery. In some cases, uh, mostly when you have a uh, atherosclerotic pathology of the ICA. The carotid, carotid blush may not come from the uh, ophthalmic artery and may, and may come mostly from anastomosis from the uh, angular artery, uh, which is a branch of the, um, of the fascia. In most of cases, more or less 85%, uh, the ophthalmic artery runs under the optic nerve and crosses from medial to lateral, to lateral to medial, sorry. In a smaller number, it can have a more uh, portal trajectory and it comes to medial to lateral. Another important fact, which is not a detail, that even though the ophthalmic artery is used as a classical one more for the superior limit of cardinal sinus, it's not a perfect uh, landmark. There are maybe variations, the uh, emergence part, uh, part of the artery may be intracavernous, it may be uh, higher than, than usual. And uh, uh, we must be aware of this dural space uh, along the medial aspect of the ICA, the carotid cave, uh, which is uh, due to the fact that the distal dural ring is not exactly at the same level in all parts of the clinical segments of ICA at this point. So the limits of the cavernal sinus at this exact point is not horizontal. As a consequence, if you take into consideration only this classical landmark, uh, on angel for an aneurysm of this region. An aneurysm may be, a small aneurysm may be mistaken as an intercavernous one, but in reality, it's a subarachnoid one in the carotid cave. Also uh, from this region, of course, 
we can uh, we have the emergency of the uh, of the hypophysial arteries could also be superior hypophysial, which also can be possible origins of uh, of aneurysms. So uh, when you we continually see a superior uh, superior tree to see uh, the uh, the arterial void or artery, and then uh, 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 so, sorry. Uh, Posterior communicating artery and then the anterior coronary artery. And I'd like to well, take... please come near the microphone. Okay, okay, okay. So I'd like to take some minutes uh, to show you some of these interesting uh, angiographic variants. Uh, you see, uh, as I mentioned before, the very typical change in diameter. You see the P curve and the and then the P2 segment, and this is uh, something like. Uh, you, you, we would like to see uh, every time, such as we see in the books, you see contrast coming to the pecan, and then you see beautiful washing, and you have almost no washing here. So, of course, it's difficult to prove before injecting the vertebral artery, but very probably you have a very small or even absent P1 segment here. And then you, you can have even very tiny pecan, as you see here, or even maybe even absent, as in this case. Uh, with an enlarged emergency, in this case of the infundibulum, and then uh, uh, a very large pecone, which has the same diameter of the PCA. Uh, the P1 may be completely absent here, and this is what we call a fatal, uh, fatal variant. So the variants at the level of polygon are, uh, are very common. When you do a lot of, uh, of angiography, you see uh, mostly or asymmetries of communicating arteries, asymmetries of the uh, anterior communicating complex. Uh, you see here both HU filling from a single A1, uh, hypoplastic A1 from a side, azygos A2, um, dominant vertebral, which is the communication between the vertebral and the abdominal, maybe a very tiny or absent from one side, fenestrations, and even more uh, strange things, as you can see here, contrast was injected inside the internal cerebral artery. And then you see that part, the uh, superior third of the vertebral of, of the basilar artery, is very well local pacified. Uh, and you see even the uh, superior cerebral artery and uh, PCA. And this is not the posterior communicating, the posterior communicating here. So, what is this? This is persistence of the trigeminal artery, which is an embryonary element. So, if we take a look to the uh, distal branches, uh, by a matter of time, we will mostly focus on the uh, anterior circulation. You have, to, which is a continuity of the fissure classification. So, for the anterior cerebral artery, we can also identify segments. We see A1 pre communicating, A2 post communicating with also infracalosal, A3 uh, pre callosal which uh, surrounds the uh, genu of the corpus callosum, A4 supra callosum, and A5 posterior callosum with many times anastomosis with the posterior poro artery. Posterior callosal artery comes from the PCA. So you have an entire circle uh, that may be uh, present around the corpus callosum. And the emergence of the uh, of callosal marginal artery, which is also quite variable, sometimes more inferior, sometimes more superior. So let's see, take a look at this um, in angels. So you have A1, A2, once again, A2, A3, A4, and then A, A, uh, the, the connection of the posterior uh, cerebral, cerebral artery. So um, Let's take a look again on uh, this uh, practical angles of uh, we just said uh, about the variation of the uh, polygonal pillies. So what's happening here? The two systems, left and right, are completely disconnected. So probably uh, anterior communicating artery here is very small or even absent. What can be confirmed by uh, doing a contralateral compression of the uh, common carotid during injection or uh, contrast medium. Here we have the opposite, so we have a very well developed anterior communicating artery. So both HUs are filling from the same carotid and from the same um, uh, from the same A1. So what we have to confirm here when we inject the other carotid is if there is a symmetry of uh, of a one segment, which is an important information for both <coughs> embolization or, or surgery of an aneurysm of this region. Here in this MRI imaging. 
also interesting. You see, uh, like a nasal artery, but actually uh, you have you still have um, a communicating artery which is fenestrated here. You have a nasal sphere. You have a symmetry. We had a symmetry of A1 segments in this case. Both uh, both arteries, both H2 filling from the same side, and and an aneurysm there. For the middle cerebral artery. Uh, same thing, Fischer classification. So M1 is the horizontal portion, the sphenoidal portion. So it's not only up to the bifurcation, it's really the sphenoidal portion. So it means that if you have an early bifurcation it, it, with a very short um, trunk, it's still M1. So M2 is the insular portion. And then you have this very closed core, and then you have opercular portico and terminal branches. So what is interesting uh, to see is for all of those branches, not only the middle cerebral artery, is try to see the anatomy behind the vessels, not only the vessel. So when you see this uh, front angiogram like this, and you see the transition N1 and 2, we know that this transition is the level of the limit of the insula. So let's imagine here the limit of the insula. So I know the basal glands are there. These are lenticular estriates. Then you, uh, we have the insular branches. I see the uh, uh, the insula gyri right here. If you take a look of the uh, of the um, of the lateral angiogram, we see in the left. You can even uh, imagine you you see that vessels are depicting for you the anatomy of the gyri right and sulci of the insula. And then uh, those M two branches they will turn sharply. To contour the frontal and parietal operculum, and of course the temporal operculum also, and all those change of directions will draw for you this triangle, this triangle, which is which is the insula. So uh, different uh, different angiograms, same same thing. You see all those changes of direction, and the last change of direction will correspond to the posterior posterior cilium point. Some variants. So we have a M1, quite long one, transition M1 2, an early temporal branch with an aneurysm, is a trifurcation or pseudo trifurcation. Same thing also with an aneurysm. An early frontal branch is so M1 will be up to here. And then you see a, a level with every frontal branch and aneurysm. More strange thing, we have here an early temporal branch and an M1 level. Um, it was a very, very difficult case. It took also some time to understand. Um, fenestration in the trunk in M1 segment, and inside the fenestration, a small aneurysm emerging, and then with a lot of allergic lacerated arteries there, and even one of them was coming from the aneurysm itself. So, posterior cerebral artery, uh, also classification in segments, pre communicating P1. Post communicating P2 with pedicular and quadrigeminal portion. So we can uh, talk about, uh, sorry, pedicular and, and the end portion. Um, so we can talk about P2A and P2P. Uh, and then P3, quadrigeminal, and P4, P4, uh, cortical, and terminal uh, branches. So, really interesting how this anatomy and also draws for us. Once again, the, uh, the cortical, the parenchymal anatomy behind it. So usually in lateral angiograms, you have this aspect of uh, the artery is ascendant. And this, as you go, posterior is going to be more and more separated than the, uh, to the branches of the uh, superior cerebral artery. So because these branches will be under the tutorial and will draw for you the tutorial surface of the, um, of the cerebellum. And this, you have a passage uh, up to the tutorial. Sometimes you have a kind of abrupt change of direction. I have this in a, one of the next slides, which is drawing for you the exact point of the, uh, the border of the tutorial is. And then very typically posterior, you have this Y shape of bifurcation because one of uh, the continuity of the artery, one of the branches will get inside the calcarine fissure. So it's drawing for you the occipital lobe and you know that the lips of the copper and the fissure are there. So this is lingula, this is cuneus. And the other branches will get inside the um, parieto occipital uh, sulcus. And so you know this is percuneus. 
So uh, same thing. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time. It'll be uh, time for another lecture to detail all the uh, button buzz bar system. A, we still have the Venus system, but we'll have a lecture on the Venus system with Professor Victor Hugo uh, in uh, some minutes. And you see here the very typical uh, bifurcation I just sold, showed, and of course, all those branches we can come, uh, come with. Uh, for the basilar, we see uh, is here the uh, superior cerebral artery, superior contralateral well, duplicated, bifurcated. We can have also duplications of all of those arteries. And uh, also in this vertebral basilar portion, the most uh, uh, the artery which is most prone to variations uh, or is the, um, the vertebral artery. So in the Fisher classification, we recognize it's four segments for the vertebral artery. One is the prevertebral segment, which is from the origin, from the superior aspect of subiclavin uh, up to the penetration in the first uh, uh, lateral process transverse forces, which usually the uh, transverse forces of C6. C6. Then you have this uh, vertebral interforaminal uh, segment, which is quite uh, vertical. And then when the uh, artery leaves the transverse forces of C2 to get it into the foramagnal, this is the atlantal portion. Uh, and uh, so V3, and then you have Many times a small constriction here, and you know that the artery is getting inside the, uh, the dura, and you have V4, V4 uh, segment, which is, uh, which is intradural one. So this uh, is, uh, as I saw, you, you see the, uh, the, the changes in direction I just uh, showed you. So for sure, this from here, I have already completely out of the, uh, of the uh, foramen of Achille. So uh, this is uh, this is what I just showed you is quite variable. You see that uh, in this case we have a small dominance of uh, outer, uh, lateral arteries. They are quite symmetric, but they are not really symmetrical. When we have lateral artery dominance, in most cases the dominant one is the left one. And what happens to the other? Uh, we can have just a, a smaller one, but it is still working. Uh, as a vertebral artery with a confluent to the to the basilar one, uh, or you can have a very small one, tiny one, which is completely finishing in pica, often a large pica, and you, you may have no communication with the basilar at all. So when we have this kind of pattern, most cases is uh, is left apart than right apart. So it's a, something we we'll, we we should check. Um, before um, embolizing or operating uh, vascular lesions of this of this region. So that's what I uh, I wanted to show. I, I hope it was useful. And once again, it was it's a fantastic experience. And thanks a lot. Tom, unmute yourself. I'm here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so again, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, it has covered a lot of ground again in, in a very short period of time. Um, we have uh, don't have a huge amount of uh, time left. A lot, lot of it was <laughs> self-explanatory. I can't see any very burning questions that we really have to go through it. I can see um, Professor Victor who go ready uh, to speak uh, while he is uh, preparing and um, starting to share his desktop. I, I'll briefly introduce him. Uh, Professor uh, Victor Hugo Perez is from uh, Mexico. He's a master neurosurgeon, anatomist, and also expert in forensic and medical legal affairs. Um, and uh, today he'll be talking to us about uh, often neglected in a very important um, part of neurosurgical anatomy, which is the venous anatomy. And I can see his presentation loaded and I'll mute and let uh, Professor Hugo speak. Thank you uh, to all of you. 
Uh, Ahmad and Vlad, I am very happy to be in this important course. Let's start with uh, Venus anatomy. Um, uh, I took uh, some text of uh, Albert Rotten to explain the uh, fantastic uh, Venus anatomy. Uh, frequent variations in the size and connections of these veins have made it difficult to define a normal pattern. And the nomenclature used to describe the veins has infrequently been applicable to the operative situation. The fact that sacrifice of the major trunks of the deep venous system only infrequently leads to venous infarction with mass effect and neurological deficit is attributed to the diffuse anastomosis between the veins. But uh, I think um, anatomy uh, of the veins, of the cerebral veins, has not been described um, as well as uh, we can see in the exercise of doing uh, dissection an injection of cerebral, of cerebral veins. Uh, th this is the lateral aspect. Uh, 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 well, uh, this is the frontal view of the brain stem. And of course, in here we can see a uh, very good anastomosis between the veins in front of the brain stem, uh, the midbrain, the pons, and the oblongate medulla. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this image is uh, really beautiful because uh, you can see the, the rich anastomosis between these veins. The cerebral veins may pose a major obstacle to operative approach to deep-seated lesions, especially in the pineal region, uh, in this uh, uh, part of the brain. Uh, under uh, the temporal uh, bone and uh, the, post, the, the part of the superior sagittal sinus. This is the uh, superior sagittal sinus and these are anastomotic in the lateral aspect of the brain. So I'm going to, I want to show you this uh, video. Um, Okay, okay. Uh, here uh, I am doing a dissection of the arachnoid membrane. Uh, as you can see, uh, we need to, to make a careful dissection of uh, the sagittal sinus and the veins that drain into this important structure. So, of course, uh, this is a, a model, this is a, a specimen, a brain, but uh, the same care uh, we need to take in order to avoid uh, damage these important veins. These are known also as uh, uh, bridging veins. Especially in uh, dissection of uh, tumors like uh, meningiomas in the, in the sagittal, superior sagittal sinus. You can look also some arteries that are coming from anterior cerebral artery.
So uh, this is a great meningeal. Uh, when you need to dissect this uh, uh, lesion, this uh, tumor, uh, we need to take uh, uh, care to, to preserve this, uh, the veins uh, that go into the sagittal sinus. So uh, the superficial veins are uh, distributed in four uh, um, groups. The first group is the superior sagittal, and this is composed of the veins that drain into the superior sagittal sinus. This is uh, another injection, another brain. Uh, we can see in here uh, the, the posterior part and anterior part of the sagittal sinus. And this is, uh, and these are uh, some uh, veins draining into the uh, superior sagittal sinus. Uh, this, uh, uh, this extension of veins are uh, known as uh, Venus lacunae. Uh, the other group is uh, sphenoidal. Uh, the sphenoidal group is uh, formed by the bridging veins that empty into the sinuses that cause on the inner surface of the sphenoid bone, formed by uh, the terminal ends of the superficial sylvian and occasionally the deep sylvian veins drains a part of the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes adjoining the sylvian fissure. The tentorial group of uh, bridging veins drains into the sinuses, coursing in the tentorium, or into the transverse and superior petrosal sinuses in the tentorial margins. The group is composed of the veins draining the lateral surface of the temporal lobe, this is temporal lobe and occipital lobes. This group includes the temporobasal and occipitobasal veins and the descending veins, including the vein of Lave from the lateral surface of the temporal lobe. Uh, this is uh, another uh, video. Um, uh, in this, uh, I want to show you the lateral aspect of uh, this brain and the rich anastomosis of this uh, group of veins. Uh, this is uh, the sylvian vein, the, uh, also known as superficial middle cerebral brain. Uh, this is the vein of Lave and vein of Trollard. As you can see, we have a rich anastomosis in this, uh, in this uh, lateral aspect of the brain. But we have uh, variations in the venous uh, drainage. Uh, sometimes uh, we could have uh, only a, a, a good uh, vein of Labe, but it doesn't have a good anastomosis with Sylvian and also the vein of Trollar. Uh, in this uh, lateral aspect of the brain, uh, we can see the uh, vein of Trollar, uh, the frontoparietal uh, vein, this uh, great anastomotic vein, and in here we have the vein of Lave. So this is a, a small anastomosis of this, uh, of this uh, vein. Here we have uh, the, the, this, the, this frontal vein uh, going to the uh, sylvian vein. And this is the vein of Lave and the transverse sinus. This is anterior uh, temporal vein. The, uh, the Falcine group uh, is formed by the veins that empty into the inferior sagittal 
or straight sinus, either directly or uh, through the internal cerebral, basal, and great veins. This is the falcine group. These veins go to the inferior sagittal sinus. The dural sinuses into which the cortical veins empty are the superior and inferior sagittal, straight, transverse, tentorial, cavernous, sphenoparietal, sphenobasal, and sphenopetrosal sinuses. These sinuses form the terminal part of the superficial cortical venous system. This is a dissection of a brain when, where we can see the superior uh, longitudinal sinus, the transverse sinus. Here uh, we have the straight sinus. And this is the skull base in its uh, endo, uh, endocranial view. Uh, here we have the confluence of the uh, transverse sin sinus and the superior longitudinal sinus. Here we have the, the sigmoid sinus, superior petrosal sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, and cavernous sinus in this part. In this uh, picture, uh, we can see the, the cellar region, cavernous sinus, uh, the left, the right, and the intercavernous sinus. Uh, so doing dissection of uh, these uh, models, uh, we understand much better the anatomy of uh, the venous system. Here we have the straight sinus uh, that go posteriorly to enter to the confluence uh, of the uh, of these veins, the superior sagittal sinus and transverse uh, sinus. If uh, we advance uh, uh, for uh, dissection, uh, uh, we have two major uh, distributors into the great vein, uh, also known as uh, vein of uh, Galeno or Galeno's vein. Uh, these are the internal cerebral veins uh, associated with uh, thalamus and the plexus uh, choroides. They travel posteriorly to join the, this uh, uh, galenos vein. And the other distributors are uh, basal veins, uh, also known as, uh, as um, uh, Rosenthal uh, basal veins. Uh, another view with uh, the longitude, superior longitudinal sinus and the transverse uh, sinus. Here we have uh, occipital vein. Uh, as I told you uh, in the brain stem, we have a very good anastomotic uh, veins. So also in, in, in the lateral aspect, so he, here we have the vein, the vein of la ve, this one. In this uh, brain, I did a um, resection of uh, the gray substance of temporal lobe. And in here, we can see the straight sinus, the sigmoid sinus. And uh, um, where uh, do the vein of la ve is located? So uh, this is uh, almost one centimeter posterior to the junction of straight sinus and sigmoid sinus. Almost one centimeter posterior to this junction we localize uh, this uh, important vein, the vein of la ve. And uh, here we have also the uh, middle cerebral artery in first uh, segment, the second, third, and fourth, the cortical arteries, the branches of this middle cerebral artery. The endocranial view of uh, a skull base. If, uh, uh, I am doing also some uh, models uh, for uh, residents, especially the 
uh, in these models made in the scale one per one, also the, the skull, not the uh, cranial nerves. Um, uh, in these uh, models, we can see uh, in an schematic uh, view, the sigmoid sinus, the superior petrosal sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, clival, clival sinus, and in this part we have the cavernous sinus. Uh, these models uh, are made to understand the anatomy of uh, this important region. Uh, here we have the middle fossa, a posterior fossa, and here we have the, the um, some uh, venous affluence to the superior petrosal uh, sinus, uh, the cavernous sinus, anterior clanoidal uh, optic nerve, supraclinal carotid artery, third cranial nerve, fourth, uh, fifth, and the other uh, uh, cranial nerves. So uh, what I want uh, you to, to see is the um, venous drainage of, uh, in this uh, uh, middle fossa. Uh, you can see in here, in this uh, brain, we do not have a good uh, vein of La B. Instead, we have uh, some venous affluence in the inferior part uh, that are coming from the inferior part of the temporal lobe like this. This is really, really uh, uh, an interesting feature of uh, venous drainage because uh, if uh, uh, you are going to make, uh, for example, an anterior petrosal or presigmoid approach to the pet petrosal region, uh, you need to be very, very careful uh, because uh, we can damage these, uh, these veins and we could have a disaster in, in the post-operatory or the transoperatory uh, procedure, surgical procedure. Uh, in this part of the posterior clivus, uh, we can see uh, the, the clival, clival sinus. Uh, I showed you this uh, picture. Uh, this is uh, really nice to, to the for the comprehension of uh, the venous system, the deep venous system and the sinus. And this is another uh, model. Uh, this is the straight uh, uh, sinus and the two major distributors to the great, to the great uh, uh, cerebral vein, also known as, uh, as galeno, vein of uh, galeno or galenos vein. Uh, these are the, basal, uh, the Rosenthal basal veins and uh, the, the internal cerebral veins. Uh, this is another uh, picture of the a posterior aspect of uh, the brain and uh, the, some uh, occipital veins, the striate uh, uh, sinus and the uh, venous confluence. Uh, in this uh, venous angiogram, uh, we can see a variation of uh, the um, sinus. So we have a hyperplastic uh, uh, transverse sinus uh, and also the sigmoid sinus. Uh, but uh, we have also a, 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 a nastomotic uh, sinus uh, that uh, is uh, the occipital, the occipital sinus. In the other side, we do not have a, a good uh, uh, transverse sinus. So uh, in the preoperative uh, 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 procedure for uh, some petroclay violation, we need uh, to know uh, the state of uh, the venous system in order to avoid a lesion to these uh, important veins. So this model, uh, I, I, this is uh, only an example 
that uh, we should uh, need a very basal approach in order to see uh, the uh, neural and vascular uh, components of the cranial base. Uh, if we do not uh, make a good approach, it's uh, difficult to see these uh, uh, important structures. And uh, in that case, uh, we should uh, uh, retract uh, the temporal lobe and could damage uh, the brain. So uh, if we, like in this case, if we make a very basal approach, we are going to, to see with a less retraction of the temporal lobe this, uh, these nerves. Uh, here we have the, the fifth uh, cranial nerve, uh, third, uh, fourth, and uh, fifth. Uh, inside the cavernous sinus, the six cranial nerves. Uh, so this is a, 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 a model made in, with uh, silicon and resin. The resin is uh, uh, in scale one per one to a real one. So uh, this is uh, another uh, variation in, in, in the venous drainage. Uh, uh, you can identify uh, very well the, the variation. This is a hyperplastic uh, transverse sinus. Uh, this is a hypoplastic uh, transverse sinus. Uh, this is a superior sagittal sinus, the venous lacunae and this anastomotic uh, vein that, go, that goes into the superior sagittal sinus. So the other uh, uh, cranial vein sinus uh, is, of course, uh, the cavernous. So uh, here uh, we can see the, the, the venous uh, cavernous uh, sinus. So this is the intracavernous carotid artery. And here we have the six cranial nerve. Um, I made this dissection to understand the anatomy of the cavernous sinus. Uh, here we have the meningo hypophyseal trunk, the tentorial, also known as Bernasconi casinari. This uh, uh, could be the dorsal meningeal artery. And this one uh, could be also superior, inferior hypophyseal artery. Um, here we have the lateral artery of the intracavernous carotid artery. Um, optic nerve. Uh, this is uh, the, a view of the clivus. So uh, look, this is uh, really nice uh, to make uh, this kind of dissection to understand the, this uh, venous uh, drainage of the, of the brain. The intercavernous uh, uh, sinus, anterior, posterior intercavernous sinus, the right cavernous sinus, tear cranial nerve in the right side, left side, and the, this, uh, the fourth cranial nerve and fifth cranial nerve. Another uh, view of the superior uh, uh, aspect of the brain, uh, in this you can see the, this uh, venous lacuna. Uh, this is very important when you want to dissect or when you need to dissect uh, some tumors, uh, you need to, to keep in mind that uh, this uh, venous lacuna uh, can be misinterpreted uh, as uh, sagittal sinus. Uh, they are also, they, these uh, are an extension of uh, the superior sagittal sinus. Here we have another view of the superior aspect of uh, this brain. The, here we have uh, uh, this uh, inferior petrosal sinus. 
So uh, in order to understand the, the brain, uh, not uh, only arteries and veins, but uh, the um, different components of the deep uh, structures of uh, the brain uh, is uh, important to make a dissection, to make cuts, to stain uh, uh, sometimes uh, this uh, uh, brain. And if you do this kind of uh, dissection, uh, we can understand much better anatomy of uh, the brain. Uh, now with uh, COVID disease, I think it's going to be more difficult to make uh, dissections because uh, uh, we do not know in patients with um, that die, uh, have or not have a, a COVID disease. So, uh, but I think uh, uh, we, 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 we can do with uh, some uh, care, uh, the dissection, continue with this uh, uh, exercise because it's very important. Uh, this is superior aspect of midbrain. Uh, and here we can see the <clears throat> basilar artery. Uh, it's bar bifurcation in posterior cerebral arteries. And uh, this is the uh, superior cerebellar artery, <clears throat> in this case, in the other case. So uh, thanks, uh, uh, greetings uh, from Mexico. Uh, hope uh, uh, we could uh, organize uh, the Congress uh, next year. It depends on uh, advance uh, of uh, COVID disease. But uh, best uh, wishes to all of you and thank you for listening to me. Uh, this, uh, this is end. Well, Perez, thank you very much for a um, beautiful lecture showing us lots of beautiful uh, dissections. Um, while uh, the next speaker is getting ready, um, we have time to, <coughs> excuse me, answer perhaps one question coming from Radames Ramirez Cano. What advice would you give um, for dissecting complex venous structures in the sylvan fissure. I presume the question is about, um, do you have any tips on opening sylvan fissure, particularly when there are lots of uh, juicy veins in there? Victor, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, I wonder whether 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 the question was clear. I suppose the the question is whether you have any personal tips on opening the sylvan fissure, particularly uh, thinking of um, um, the venous structures. Uh, excuse me again. Um, um, th there's been a, a question whether you have any tips. Okay. Okay. On opening uh, so the sylvan fissure. Okay, so if you inject uh, the venous system and also the, the arteries, uh, uh, of course uh, the brain uh, needed to be, uh, needs to be uh, prepared with formalin and uh, you should use uh, micro scissors to open uh, the, the sylvian vein but uh, specifically, uh, you are going to make a good dissection if you inject previously the, the brain, all veins and also arteries. So I think uh, it's uh, the most important to understand Sylvian fissure. I suppose for um, the patients that are not in formalin yet, um, the way to do it is, is to mostly stay frontally and take your time and try to understand which veins belong to the temporal lobe, which veins belong to the frontal lobe. There might be some small anastomosis and, and just remain clean, uh, not much retraction 
and that's supposed to be kind of my my tip for that. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad we managed to go through the Venus system because of uh, lots of um, catastrophes that we see post surgery are often attributed to fate or, or things like that, but um, often the cause is Venus. So the more we understand, the more we respect, the more we um, view veins uh, before surgery, the uh, less surprises we will get uh, at the end, even in the few post operative days. Now, it's a true pleasure. Um, um, uh, Introducing um, Ramez Kirolos, Professor Kirolos from um, National Neurosciences, <coughs> excuse me, Institute in Singapore. Um, uh, Ramez and I started um, pretty much at the same time uh, in Cambridge. Me as a trainee, him as a as a consultant, and um, it's been a fantastic uh, journey of um, friendship since I've, I've learned a great deal. And I have to say, even as a junior trainee, um, I, when operating on Ramos's AVMs, I, I, I thought I could do anything and somehow it just looked all so simple. And it is because of understanding of AVMs. And, and I'm delighted to um, introduce uh, Ramos to you and specifically his talk on how to understand AVM. Ramos. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, uh, Imad and Vladimir, to allow me to join. And this uh, uh, continuation from the excellent talks from um, uh, Igor and uh, Victor. Um, so this is uh, an entirely anatomical talk. Oh, I cannot advance. Uh, Try space. No. Arrows. Ramesh, Ramesh, if you're on a Mac, I had this problem you yesterday. The mouse. You can just tap and on the mouse pad. You are, and you are on work. the yeah. mouse works well. Okay. Try, try it, yeah. Right. So right. Uh, it is mainly to uh, continue the talk and it's uh, to show the value of how much anatomical understanding makes your surgery technically simple and easy and makes sense because these are complex AVMs. And as you can see, you have to have some understanding what's underlying that to undergo your surgical uh, planning. And in fact, this is a, what seems to you to be a disorganized structure or lesion. You have to make some order out of it. And the more you study, the more you know, the, uh, then you, you will see exactly what you have to do and your technique is simple. And the fact is that uh, we have to know that AVMs are malformations of the capillary beds. That means this is the, it is not a malformation of the arteries or the vessels or the veins feeding it or draining. So they are in a normal anatomical uh, arrangement. Of course, there is a normal uh, variation in normal anatomy. They may look, uh, morphologically uh, bizarre, dilated, but still the arrangement is normal. So the more you know about the normal vascular anatomy, which you have heard in the last two lectures, the more you will understand ABMs. So the vascular arrangement, we have seen the cisternal, where you have uh, in the arterial system, the cisternal parts, the um, circle of Willis, but then the vessels goes to the sulci, cortical, and then we have lost knowledge of the angiographic anatomy of distal vessels. And uh, it is very important to know it, not just as a vascular surgeon, but for any intracranial surgeon, because this is how you do your tumors, your metastasis and so on. So you, you have to have some knowledge about them. There are other, and you have to know that all these cortical vessels, they do perforate uh, the cortex. They do supply the subcortical structures. What we call true perforators are vessels that are uh, perforating the brain substance without giving cortical branches. And again, it's very important to know the arrangement around the ventricle. And the fact that in the brain, as you can see here and all the other talks, that not every artery have a vein uh, 
traveling with it. It's not like the femoral artery and femoral vein and so on. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So the, the venous anatomy is very important, but what we see sometimes looks bizarre to you because they are dilated, but in fact, they are all there. There are some transcerebral veins that are, you don't see them, but, and they become a problem during AVM surgery, but they are there. But the fact is in AVM, they become enlarged. So to the key around that is that you have to know that all these cortical branches for AVM have a large subarachnoid segment, and then they perforate uh, in the parenchyma itself to the AVM. That means it's imperative in your technique to have a wide arachnoidal dissection and identify these. And uh, now it is not only to know the vessels, but you have to know how will that uh, help you to reach the nidus. So we, in planning, we look at MRI scans. MRI scans are good for all these things, as you can see here. In particular, the white matter tracts. By the way, this is a, a photograph I took. This is the first ever human MRI uh, machine. It is housed in the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. It's uh, great to see it yourself. But the MRI scan shows you some flow voids. You cannot just look at it and you know where is the feeders. You can predict them because every region has a particular blood supply, but you don't know uh, because you cannot estimate the size accurately. You, all you see is some flow voids. They can be nidus, they can be perinidal. So you rely on the angiograms. And looking at angiograms is a, a skill on its own. This is what the radiologist will tell you and you should know. But again, you should look at the angiogram with the surgeon eye. And what you need to know, all these vessels that, the, the, that they are named, the cortical vessels, you have to know where they are in relation to the brain. It's not enough to identify them on an angiogram and to be aware of the different compartments. For example, in the superior frontal uh, gyrus, there is a blood supply both from the anterior cerebral medially and from the MCA. And then you uh, put in your mind some structure and this structure is a sphere, this is an idus, and has uh, draining veins, feeding arteries. And what you have to put in your mind, of course, there are some virtual reality uh, models that can rotate this for you, but you have to uh, train yourself how to, to see it. Because what you need to see is not only the structure, you have to put it together with the brain and white matter tracks. And then you have to look at it, how would you reach the edge of the nidus? So identifying the arterial feeders, you, you think you need to identify them to have control. Of course, it's useful to have control, but in fact, the most difficult vessels are the tiny ones you don't see. But the reason why you have to identify the, the artery because it will take you to the margins of the nidus. And you will see from now on, the most difficult part of AVM surgery, the, I mean complex AVMs, is to identify the true margins of the nidus. So in summary, you rely on the MRI scan to predict uh, where the vessels, because you know in certain areas, the, the frontal lobe is supplied by the MCA branches, but also you, you have to uh, teach yourself how to read an angiogram and say, where is the nidus without seeing an MRI scan? And we will go through them uh, in a few examples. The other problem aspect of AVM surgery, although in the Spetzler Martin classification, it talks about eloquence regarding the cortex, but it's the white matter tract disruption that causes your permanent deficits. There is no uh, capacity for uh, uh, recovery there if you disrupt it. And how you know how to localize them, of course, you don't have this nice white matter dissections that we all seen today in the human brain. But what we know is that uh, deep to the U fibers, which is at the depth of the sulci, you start to have the important white matter tract. So another important technical step when you go around an AVM is to really have the adjacent uh, sulcal dissection to the depth of the sulcus, because the depth of the sulcus will estimate to you where is the white matter tract. And luckily, a lot of the AVM major part of the nidus is subcortical. Of course, they tra transgress this white matter tract because they reach the ventricle, but the majority of the lesion is subcortical. 
So I, have, I don't have to go through all the white matter consideration, but as a vascular surgeon that uh, you ignore uh, surgeon doing glioma surgery, you have to have knowledge uh, about your white matter tract as good as any brain surgeon. And again, different deep structure, like in the cerebellum, you have the dentate nucleus and the deep nuclei, you have to know their anatomy as well. So again, to emphasize to you, this is the problem. When you open a case and you see this structure here, you don't know where the night is, you do nothing. So you have to widely dissect the arachnoid space. You have to go through the depths of the sulci and you try to follow what you know on the angiogram. For example, you know this artery give a branch here and then end in the AVM, you have to find it. And until you uh, dissect and match what you already know from the angiogram, uh, what you see, then you start your operation. Uh, and these are different examples here. Because the, the biggest problem I told you is uh, uh, what causes a lot of morbidity is that you don't identify exactly where are the margins of the nidus, which is a very difficult task because we have a perinidal zone. We can have a compact nidus like that. We can have a diffuse nidus with some perinidal changes. So you really have to identify so that you don't injure around or you leave part of the nidus that will bleed into the parenchyma. But when we look at the feeders and you can see trint on it, this is not a hemangioblastoma or a cavernoma. There is no blind ends. You don't see it angiographically, but every part of the wall has tiny feeders going into it. And you have to respect them even more than the large ones. How many they are, so your dissection around the nidus depends. If you are causing a wider dissection, of course, it does not look elegant for the operative videos. But in fact, it is a safer uh, method to dissect because you encounter less feeding vessels. And also we have studied with Professor Michael Morgan when he was visiting us in Cambridge. We are studying the remodeling of the feeding of the perinidal vessels after the section of AVM. So you have all these perinidal vessels, they have not remodeled yet. And we can, if you uh, don't respect them, they, you can have intra or post-operative hemorrhage. What makes uh, dissection easier are the patients who have previous hemorrhage because you have a gliotic brain similar to uh, brainstem cavernomas. Uh, so, the, so you have a gliotic brain that increases your uh, safety of the perinidal zone. But of course, you cannot go widely around the whole nidus so, uh, because you will injure the structure like the white matter tracks. So the, that's why you need to know where they are. And also you have to uh, respect all the en passant uh, branches. So this is, uh, again, uh, I know that you all know that. But, but this is a continuation from the excellent vascular uh, talk by Igor. Uh, uh, this, we start with the M3 branches, which is the operculum branches, and then the M4 branches of the MCA. And there is two trunks, the upper trunk of the M2 and the lower trunk of the M2. And what they give, they give uh, branches in uh, sequences. So you have the lateral uh, orbit, uh, frontal orbital, you have the prefrontal, they are multiple and they can have branches. There is some variation in them. You have a, a pre-Rolandic uh, branch, a central or a Rolandic branch and the uh, anterior parietal. But you have to know where they are. So on the brain, because it's not enough that uh, you, you know their names without knowing where they are on the brain. So this is, I put you here in the, where the location adjacent to which sulcus. While the lower trunk so, uh, gives the first branch, which, which will be the posterior parietal going to the superior parietal lobule, while the angular branch giving the uh, lower uh, inferior parietal lobule. Then the temporal lobe will get the posterior temporal, anterior temporal, and near the lateral part, the temporopolar branch. And you have to know where they are located as shown on this uh, uh, table. The anterior cerebral is easier. We already have seen them. So from the proximal A2s, you get a, a front orbital branch going to the orbital surface of the frontal lobe, while the frontal polar going to the frontal pole, and then you have the supracallosal segments, the A3, A4, and A5, while the callosal marginal is adjacent to the singular gyrus and uh, supply 
the superior uh, frontal lobe. That's why this is a saddle area that gets blood supply from both uh, MCA and ACA. Now, this is important to recognize the distal branches of the posterior cerebral artery, which has this configuration. You have a first segment in the interpeduncular cistern, and then the P2 in the cisterna ambience around here. And the P2 gives the important cortical branches. It gives the lateral posterior choroidal artery, which really goes to the choroid plexus, but gives some supply to the parahippocampal structures, while you get two small branches. You don't normally see them large, but they are very important in the AVM, which are on the tentorial surface of the temporal lobe, the anterior and posterior temporal artery. And then just at the junction between the ambience and the quadrigeminal segments, you just get this uh, splenial artery, or uh, uh, Igor called it the uh, posterior callosal artery, which is important because we operate on few uh, corpus callosum AVMs, and that becomes an important uh, uh, feeding artery. And then it terminates in the two terminal branches, which is in the parieto occipital and the carcarine fissure. When you look at the angiogram, this wasting here is the area where the tentorial hiatus lies. So all these uh, segments are supratentorial uh, and on the medial occipital lobe. So we have to know where they are. So we'll go to frontal lobe AVMs. You can read the table yourself, but these are the branches that comes and supply uh, the surfaces of the frontal lobe. You have a lateral surface, a medial surface, and an orbital surface. And these are the arches that you go through them and how to identify them on an angiogram. So we'll take examples. So if you look at this angiogram, now the problem with, uh, with the AVMs, that the arteries are shunting the blood. So you don't see good filling of the other branches. But what we see here, that this is probably, so what you have to identify is really, really the uh, opercular segment, which is the M3. And it has a distinct appearance. They look like semicirculars or loops. So we know that the operculum is here because of the appearance of these vessels. And then you have this segment, which is an M4 branch. This is probably going to be uh, one of the pre uh, rolandic uh, uh, branches. So this AVM is more or less in the middle uh, frontal gyrus and draining to the veins. And then you can follow the veins and you know uh, and the RC will take you to the margins of the AVM. For example, there is another extra draining vein which will tell you where is the posterior margin of the AVM. And if you go deep, if it is deep to the U fibers, it will uh, involve the SLS. And exactly here, as you can see, bang uh, correctly in the middle uh, frontal uh, gyrus in the premotor area. And the uh, deeper you get, deep to the U fibers, the SLF. Now this example, again, to show you how. So this is a more posterior one. So this is a Rolandic part. And you can tell because on the AP, the central uh, artery is the most lateral in the AP projection. However, this is opercular segments. I told you it looks like um, uh, semicircles. And this is straight on the uh, pre-central gyrus which is usually is the face area, which is luckily bilaterally represented. And then you can again get the poles. And then if you go deep, now this is an exception because the corona radiata is not deep to the U fibers, it's a projection fiber. So if you go anywhere deep, you will damage the motor cortex. So that's why uh, uh, deep uh, sulcal uh, dissection is not useful here. Again, this is an example how a true operculum AVMs in the uh, language speech area. This is a uh, motor uh, area uh, of the speech, and it's uh, really in the inferior and uh, frontal gyrus and going up with all these veins will take you to the margins of the folds of the vessels, and you would know that it's taking blood supplies from the prefrontal gyrus, and deeper to it, you will affect the arcuate fasciculus and the language area. And here are the opercular branches. So it is located in here in the frontal operculum. So deep, as you can see, deep to the sulci, the U fibers, you start to have the arcuate fasciculus, which is the deep part of the SLF 
and uh, deeper to it. The frontal uh, pole has a blood supply laterally from the uh, MCA. So this AVM is supplied laterally from the MCA, uh, uh, lateral frontal orbital branch, while this one is medial and it's supplied from the frontal polar. So this is the A1 and the A2 giving the A2 proximally giving the lateral orbit, uh, uh, this is, sorry, the front or, or, uh, orbital branch, while the M2 giving the lateral orbital branch. And the way to do it, if you look at the ICA silhouette, which is here, this, of course, this is a different side, but if it is lateral to the silhouette, then it's supplied by the MCA. If it is medial, it's supplied by the ACA. So looking at the angiogram without an MRI scan at all, you can tell where it is. The medial ones, as you can see, uh, there is a pattern now, you, so you know that uh, this AVM will be adjacent to your SMA uh, so, uh, area and the singular gyrus, and deep to it, there will be the white matter tract of the singular. So you'd expect this patient to have a transient uh, mutism and hemiparesis if they have an SMA syndrome. So this was the frontal lobe. The temporal lobe is more complex because it has a lateral surface and tentorial surface supplied by both the MCA branches, and again, they are coming from the lower trunk of the M2 and starts from uh, uh, the uh, pole, will have the temporal polar branch and then the anterior posterior temporal. This is the lateral surface, while the tentorial surface is getting blood supply from the P2 uh, segment, uh, giving the anterior and posterior uh, temporal branches, and again, some of the other branches to the opercular to the choroidal fissure. So this AVM, you can see is coming from the lower trunk of the M2, straight after the operculum. So this, I would expect coming out here will be located, looking just on the angiogram without an uh, MRI scan, will be locating as the superior uh, posterior part of, uh, of the temporal gyrus, which will be the uh, language area or the speech, receptive speech area. And you can tell uh, again, it is draining towards the transverse sinus to one of the Sylvian uh, system. And again, the white matter tract deep to it will of course involve the distal part of the uh, vertical part of the um, arcuate fasciculus and deeper to it, you have the uh, optic radiation. This one is another one. And just looking at the AP, it's uh, getting blood supply from the M2 lower trunk. So this is an anterior lateral uh, uh, temporal AVM. But look at the angiogram and the wealth of information. It is draining to the vein of Rosenthal. That means this AVM is extending to the tentorial surface or inferior surface of the temporal lobe. Otherwise, it won't drain deeply. And again, if you look at the AP silhouette, if it was in the uncus, it will be extending medial to the carotid, but it's all lateral. So we know it is a lateral basal anterior frontal AVM by just looking at the angiogram. I'm, I'm not telling you, you don't do an uh, MRI scan, but there is a wealth of information by studying uh, the vessels. And you know that this, to get proximal control of these arteries or to find them, you will open the Sylvian fissure. Brothers, I, I hate to sound like an anesthetist, but you have uh, two more minutes. Oh my God, okay. So this is another one in the tentorium surface and you can see a large uh, uh, temporal branch from the uh, P2. And again, similar one. So I'll go quickly through them. This one is uh, in the parahippocampal gyrus and you can tell going to the choroidal fissure because there is some supply from the anterior choroidal artery and it's draining to the vein of Rosenthal. And again, here is the choroidal fissure and uh, you can see the parahippocampal gyrus and uh, the, the vein going to the vein of Rosenthal. The parietal lobe is similarly, so I will just uh, show you the uh, slides. And again, this is an inferior parietal lobule. Uh, this is again the paracentral lobule on the medial side. And the occipital AVMs, of course, this is in the primary uh, uh, visual cortex. Uh, I will do quickly, Tom, just the cerebellum 
very fast, very fast. So you no have uh, no no need to no need to be too fast. It's it's okay. an important part. I will okay. uh, shorten my talk later. No, no. So you have the three surfaces of the cerebellum because AVMs, you know, my first 176 quarter of them were cerebellar AVMs. So there are a lot of AVMs there, and you have to know the anatomy of the loops of the because they get uh, some uh, flow annulus. So this is the arrangement. So the suboccipital surface is uh, mainly supplied by the pica, but you have to appreciate that the main blood supply of the cerebellum is the SCA, to the extent that a lot of the lateral suboccipital surface is coming from the SCA, while the SCA supplies the whole tentorial surface, while the petrosal surface adjacent to the flocculus is applied by the postmenial part of the ICA. So these are cortical branches. Uh, what is important is that the vermis itself gets a large, uh, the, this is uh, from Pablo, uh, I borrowed this uh, from him, the vermian uh, vein of the pica goes up to the superior part of the vermis. So uh, an AVM in the top of the vermis will be supplied by the pica and the SCA as well, while uh, a high AVM here may not be supplied by the pica at all. Now the venous groups, I uh, divided them into regions. The midline regions, uh, superficially, the veins is draining adjacent to the straight sinus, not necessarily directly, but through the tentorium, while more deeper, they go to the galenic system. The paramedian part, so this, you can see the veins are not following the arteries at all. They are all draining to the tentorial surface into the transverse or straight sinus, while more laterally, you get the petrosal uh, drainage. And very important because they can be connected to the middle pontine vein, and uh, you have to be careful to uh, occlude it, not uh, at its end, but as near to the nidus as possible. These are examples of AVMs, and you can see the petrosal one in the anterior one, deep AVMs and insula, we cannot go through them. AV, uh, the salamus gets uh, uh, anterior supply from the salamo uh, perforators and the uh, genetically perforators on the lateral side. And uh, what to make surgery easy, we advocate uh, this, that we use the white matter, the liquefying hematoma that have dissected the white matter sac. So if you have a hematoma that in the subacute stage, use it to cause the dissection for you. And we have used, I have used it in many cases uh, out of uh, my AVM surgery. So the takeaway message that you have to plan your surgery. There is no nothing called intracranial laparotomy. You have to know it before you are operating. The cortical vascular anatomy I showed you is not just important for vascular surgeons. It's important to know for everyone. And if you know the normal anatomical patterns, you will have a pattern recognition in your mind for the different lesion. And always use your draining veins, which you keep till the end, as a guiding pathway to the AVM nidus, while use the feeders to track the outline of its margins. So this is very important in your uh, surgery. And uh, use the, the, the arteries because they are in a normal anatomical location, so you know where to find them, and then follow them to the nidus. And they are bizarre in shape because they are wide and it is easy to find them. So the last slide, uh, don't subspecialize your knowledge, but subspecialize your practice so you know uh, brain anatomy the same uh, as vascular anatomy, whether you are a vascular surgeon or brain surgeon. And uh, just for completion, this uh, by in fact was the orbital AVMs because it's draining into the superior orbital vein. Thank you very much, Tom, for allowing me to overrun. Thank you, Ramos. It was a great, great pleasure. And I'm sure the pleasure was not only mine, but of, of the entire audience. Um, we, we don't have a great deal of um, uh, time for questions now, so I think we'll skip it. And perhaps uh, while um, you are um, ending sharing, which you have, uh, the next speaker, Professor Benesh, could get his um, sharing up and running, which is already happening, I can see. Um, it is a true honor and pleasure introducing uh, Professor Benesh. Uh, Professor Benesh is um, um, former chairman of the anatomical committee and is joining us from the arguably most beautiful city in the world, Prague. 
And um, so we have learned about the brain, we've learned about arteries, veins, and arterial venous malformations, or how to read them on scan, how to think about them. Now we're going to hear about uh, tricks and tips, how to resect um, AVMs and to treat them in general. Um, Vladimir, you're on. Thank you, Tom. Uh, it's difficult to talk on uh, AVM uh, after a mess. Uh, so I'm going to stick to technicalities, simple things and uh, simple rules how to resect the AVM. Actually, to me, you said Prague is arguably most beautiful city uh, in the world. I would uh, omit the arguably. You know, it is the most beautiful city. Punctum, nothing else. All right, let's go. I shall go step by step and I'll try to show you how I think about the AVMs. You need to know what Rames said about the normal vessels, about the normal anatomy, which is important. But you need to plan your approach, which is MR and NGO, and you like to position your patient in a way that you have the nidus on the surface, that you will go along the long axis of the nidus and that your approach will be vertical. It's uh, easiest for the neurosurgeon and it's comfortable for the neurosurgeon. So let's see this uh, frontal AVM, which obviously had the long nidus like that, which is in the left frontal lobe, which you do not want to damage, which you do not want to retract. So the obvious approach with the fetus from the anterior cerebral artery would be from the right side through the fault and see what it looks like. You are dielectric on the nidus, the fox is cut and reflected upwards, and your approach is uh, really simple, straightforward. First you hit all the feeding arteries, and then you resect the nidus quite comfortably in a comfortable way for a surgeon. So this is planning the approach, which is probably the important part at the beginning in any intracranial surgery, not only AVM, but in AVMs, you would like to sit, think about it. Here is after, there is the little aneurysm on the feeding artery, which disappeared within a year. Uh, this is the same thing on the opposite side of the brain in the uh, occipital area. If you come from the other side, you do not damage the visual cortex and you get to your AVM nicely from the contralateral side and see the post-op NGO. Uh, large enough craniotomy. This is not a topic for some uh, minimal invasive or keyhole surgery make a large craniotomy well beyond the nidus uh, margins. You would like to see the whole uh, nidus on the surface, which you can. And you would like to have some uh, margins where you see the vessels and you get your orientation as Ramez was talking about. Open, open dura carefully. There are adhesions between the nidus, especially the veins. The head veins probably have some propensity in growing into dura, so there are adhesions. Cut them, scissors actually are the most important uh, instrument in AVM surgery. And then dissect the arachnoid circumferentially to stick within the sluci, exactly as Ramez has said. So let's see what it looks like with the, all those adhesions. You see the dura, the nidus is hidden over here. And if you reflect the dura as in the tumor, you are done with your surgery because you tear all the veins and you have the bleeding which you will have have some troubles to control. So cut them sharply and be meticulous about that, especially in cases if there is an external car carotid uh, component, which is not frequent, but maybe. But even in the normal AVMs, there are these adhesions present and they are rather fragile, all these vessels. They do not have the sufficient vessel wall. They do not react as the normal arteries. Take a look how it will start bleeding. Simple touch and you have quite a lot of bleeding. So be careful about this. This is the first trick in the AVM surgery. Here is the circle dissection all around the margins. You see the AVM. Now we will go follow the same path on the other way. You would like to have your ICG, which I do not find too useful in uh, AVM surgery, but still view or use it because it's nice. Start at the arterial side. So this is the anterior temporal AVM. You will start with simple Sylvian Fisher. Uh, this section, the same as in any aneurysm, and you will find your feeding arteries coming from the middle cerebral artery. So that's, that's logical, starting from the arterial side, going to the venous side. Dissect the margins. This, this is the arachnoid sulcury 
this section. Here we have the left temporal AVM. And you see the dissection. This is the main draining vein, which is copying the uh, sylvian fissure. Here is the AVM, the nidus on the surface. And by slow and sharp dissection of the uh, arachnoid, you will be able to release the nidus and reflect it downwards, just releasing the whole T1 uh, gyrus, which actually had nothing to do with the AVM. It was only covered by the AVM, nothing more. There is a nice artery which you would be tempted to declare as the uh, main feeder. Don't coagulate it now. Never ever coagulate the artery on the first side. First, recognize what kind of artery it is. So do not coagulate this artery. And you see how we slowly reflecting the nidus downwards. Dissect all the unpassage vessels. I shall come to that uh, several times. Uh, this is, in my mind, the most important. You should consider any vessel, any artery in the vicinity of AVM as the unpassage. Patient coagulation, take your time, don't, uh, don't hurry. And cut the coagulated vessel stepwise. Just open the lumen by the first cut. If it bleeds, it's much easier to coagulate it then. If it doesn't bleed, cut the second part. If you cut it whole, then you may have a trouble by retracting the stumps into the brain. You see this tiny artery? This is the Jan Passage. It has nothing to do with the AVM. It's feeding the superior temporal gyrus. So you will dissect it and you will be still slowly reflecting the nidus. This is the same AVM as in the previous video. Here the main draining vein. Here is the draining vein within the nidus. And now we, are, we shall see the bridge between the two which you can easily sacrifice because you know there are other draining veins. This is the one. And see that I really take my time. I do not like much that uh, high-powered uh, non-stick bipolar. Everybody is talking about uh, most frequently I'm using just the regular bipolar. And it's sufficient if you really are patient and you are taking your time. Don't be lazy to switch the instruments, scissors for forceps, for whatever. Don't be lazy to tear something, cut everything, sharp dissection as much as possible. So now I don't feel that it's really coagulated sufficiently. See that I cut it in two steps. First opening the lumen doesn't bleed. All right, let's cut it further. Identify the bleeding point. Any bleeding point visit from the nidus or anywhere in the vicinity of the AVM should be treated, should be dealt with permanently. Otherwise, these uh, bleeding points have tendency to, to multiply and suddenly you are in the pool of blood. So go step by step. And again, preserve the... You see here I have torn the uh, draining vein within the nidus. And I really took my time to occlude it permanently. This, In this case, by a clip, which is on the wall, that, that the draining vein still drains the AVM. But the bleeding is dealt with permanently. No tamponate, no nothing. Something which is really permanent. Coagulation, clip, whatever. And only then go on. And now you see underneath the nidus an artery which is leaving the vicinity of the AVM. And that's exactly the one which you have seen at the beginning. And is the major branch of the middle cerebral artery which doesn't feed the AVM at all with the exception of these small perforating vessels, which you can easily now coagulate and cut. There is a loop of the vessel, which belongs to the AVM. So this is the part which you should coagulate and you should deal with, but not this one, which is actually M3 and four branches. It is a nice sulcal dissection. You get as deep as needed. And you may even measure your nidus on the uh, on MR and then me measure how deep you are because it's sometimes difficult to really estimate how deep you are, whether you already should stand below the nidus or not. So this perception is always good to have how deep you need to go and uh, when you should encounter all those uh, white matter feeders. And here's the proper feeding artery, again coming from the MCA. This is what, what happens when you get a long applier for the surface vessel and this is it and you can occlude it and then you go ahead with the resection this is after i always show the post-op so unpassage artery once more until proven otherwise until proven otherwise treat all of them like uh, 
uh, un passage. This is rather diffuse uh, nidus, and this is what you find. Here is the artery which is going on the surface of the brain, and uh, you would think that this is the feeding artery, and you would be tempted to occlude it at the beginning of surgery, which would be completely wrong because as you dissect further, let's go on to the next video. Suddenly, you see underneath another artery coming up from the brain, from the deeper, so deeper in the sulcus, and this is the true feeder. Not this one, but this one is the feeder. So you would deal with this artery, which is now exposed. Uh, it would be better to occlude it by clay, but I just occlude it by coagulation, which really, again, must be patient and time spending. Don't rush anything in AVM surgery. There is always time enough. And the disc, which is scheduled after the AVM surgery, can wait another half an hour. And you see that it's difficult to coagulate some of these uh, vessels because they do not have the sufficient vessel wall. They are not like the other vessels which you encounter in, say, brain tumors or uh, any other surgeries. And again, once you coagulate it sufficiently, you just open it by opening the lumen and then cut the vessel entirely. You can wait for that. You see that it's really time consuming, but it's just okay. And you will be switching bipolar with your scissors all the time. You need nothing else for AVM surgery. You see now the lumen is open. It doesn't bleed. Still, I was not really secure, so I used bipolar again. Now it's much easier to coagulate the vessel when it's open. I don't know why, but it always works. It is better, and only then I cut it through. And here we are at the end of surgery. In the same case, here was the nidus. And you see that the original artery, which looks like the feeder, has nothing to do with the AVM at all, that it feeds the normal brain, and you would be sacrificing the major artery, feeding the brain completely unnecessarily. The problem is, exactly as Michael Lawton said, that first it's ballet. You think that you are the best neurosurgeon in the world when you are in the region. But once you get into the white matter, it's becoming to be a battle because there are those bad uh, deep feeders, the tortuous arteries. They usually are at the top of the AVM, the typical conical AVM. So here these feeders will be. And usually the one which is most troublesome is at the ventricle wall, which uh, you would like to find uh, actively. You would be seeking this feeder from the ventricle actively. This is what it looks like. They are tortuous, all these vessels, and they are almost impossible to coagulate since the vessel wall does not nearly exist. And these vessels, they are best to be occluded by regular temp clips. Uh, aneurysm clips, or now they produce those very tiny AVM clips, which are just fine because they do not hinder your approach. They are really small, like millimeter, two millimeters, and uh, they do not take any space in your resection location. So either aneurysm clips or these small AVM clips and use them liberally. At the end of surgery, you can try to remove them. It's uh, sometimes possible, sometimes the vessel is still bleeding. So you can leave the clips behind, of course, it's not, not a problem. So the, this is the difficult part of the AVM surgery. And just uh, be a little, little in advance, the endovascular people do not know how to handle these vessels, which would be important for you. The large vessel you find and you, you coagulate it and cut, no problem in that. Those are which are occluded by endovascular people, not these deep feeders, which are much more troublesome and much more difficult to deal with. Do take in mind that uh, you should have all the important structures which are in the vicinity of AVM under your uh, control at all time. This is the Floculus AVM, small one. And you see that you would like to see fifths and sevenths, eighths all the time during your procedure. There are the feeding arteries and the draining veins just around the uh, nerves. So throughout the surgery, take care that you have control of all these uh, important structures that you do not damage them. Don't let them out of your sight. Don't let them out of your 
this is again after the surgery. Uh, very rarely you need to go along the way. It's uh, not logical. You always want to start with arteries. You always want to identify the feeding arteries, but not always is this possible. This is a tiny AVM in the quadrigeminal plate, which bled with uh, double vision for a while, which improved. Our endovascular people didn't want to embolize it because they feared that this uh, perforating artery doesn't feed the uh, AVM and that they would cause some problems. And of course they would. Uh, and I don't like send, uh, sending uh, brain stem lesions to the radio surgery. So we did surgery for this guy. guy. This is the draining vein. And in this net of uh, vasculature, you are unable to recognize which one is the feeding artery and which one is feeding the normal brain. So you just will go along the vein, cutting all the connections with the vein. This is a tedious thing. It takes time, but uh, I find it as the only way how to deal with uh, this deep-seated, eloquent area AVMs. Just go along the vein and cutting all the feeders. It uh, looks similarly to the AVM approach in a way. And this is at the end. So after one hour or two, what you resect is a shared piece of something in a diameter of two millimeters, not more. Then you cut it. And this is the bit of the AVM and all the, uh, the abnormal vessels, normal vasculature was preserved, which now will be checked with the uh, ICG. And you see that I'm even at the very end, I'm still care very careful and very slowly uh, cutting all the uh, arachnoid and all the, 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 the coagulated vessels that, that just to make sure that uh, I do not damage anything which shouldn't be damaged. And this is the ICG that the normal vasculature have. This is the stump of the draining vein. And this is the NGO after the procedure. Uh, this sounds very logical and uh, everyone uh, keeps this in mind that he or she should preserve the vein until the very end. Here you see the posterior temporal AVM with one draining vein into the sigmoid sinus. So you know that at the posterior margin of the AVM will be the uh, draining vein, which should be kept until the very end. So this is the uh, part of surgery when I had the feeling of being the best neurosurgeon all around. And then I became a little lazy and I, I used a retractor just to uh, put it behind the AVM to see this uh, margin a little better. That was the only use of retractor in this surgery. It's not a problem to coagulate the draining vein. It's easy. But this is what happens. You see the bleeding, which is uh, incessant and which is uh, difficult to control. You see the brain protruding from the uh, durotomy, so suddenly it becomes really a battle. Fortunately, we got by, only the resection was a little bit more extensive than needed. And fortunately, the patient is uh, symptom free, thanks to the location, which was uh, fine. I do not like the combined treatment. I do not like the pre op uh, embolizations, uh, because then, then you have to deal with uh, lots of uh, plastic within the brain. Uh, the, the, the vessels still bleed. You, you have problems to find the living uh, vessels which are within the plastic. And uh, I really have uh, many, many objections, but where we use it is in the large cerebral AVMs. This was very unhappy male, 1971 and born. Since, 19, uh, since 2005, when we have seen him first, he was, had cerebral symptoms and bulbar symptomatology. He had 12 hospitalizations over the years, seven embolizations, one gamma knife treatment, and that in 2002-2020. This is the original. It's combined AVM with uh, external carotid supply and with uh, vertebral bacillus system supply. And I didn't think that this is a surgical case for the first thing. So we embolized him and embolized him. And this is uh, in January this year. You see that there is uh, only feeding from the pica and some small channels through the tons of plastic. It's onyx, all of it, which he has there. And here is the draining vein. So we took him to surgery. 
and uh, you see that uh, this is the top of the AV and the highermost point where there was no uh, supply at all on the on the end geography. So and we are within the onyx area, and you see how nicely it's still bleeding. And this is the case for high powered bipolar. You see that this is something else, and this is one of the main draining uh, vessels which was embolized. And you see that it still is bleeding. And to coagulate such embolized vessel, which this onyx in its lumen, it's almost impossible. So we did it finally, and then we resected piece of the onyx. You will see it very shortly. You see that this is embolized, and there is still enough of blood running through. So it's not really complete. I, I just wonder what would happen if you would have uh, longer acquisition times in angiography for these cases, whether it would be fat or not. And this is the second part of the surgery. We are down on the in the torsier region where there was the only filling. And you see that this, again in the onyx area, it's almost impossible to control the bleeding. So this, this was really a battle. We finally managed and we didn't harm the patient. He is still the same as he used to be for many years. We've been seeing him. But you see that this surgery was not easy. This is the AV embed at the end. There was one clip left for some large artery. And there's the, here's the uh, medulla and uh, pica which fed the AVM. And this is the angio after. Yes which was quite satisfactory, but still quite a lot of onyx left behind and the post-op CT just to check the patient is almost useless with this amount. I don't like the, the emergency surgeries for, for AVM. If there is a bleeding, we always try first just to relieve the pressure by, let's say, partial uh, evacuation of the hematoma on the opposite side than the AVM niducis. But there are, of course, exceptions. This is a small AVM which bled in a young girl. So we took her to the OR immediately. And actually, this is not like other AVM surgery. This is uh, partly blind because you are unable to recognize which vessel is which, where it goes from and where it arises. So this is like a, a resection of the piece of the brain with the AVM, which is located somewhere there. So this is after. Fortunately, all these... Uh, Bleedings have uh, much better prognosis uh, than the, the other kind of bleedings from other regions. So to summarize all these points, which are plenty and which I have not uh, gone through all, is open dura carefully, then dissect the arm passage arteries. That's probably the most important message I have for you. And take extreme care with deep feeders. That's the problem where the post-op bleeding uh, is uh, done. So in conclusion, and this is not uh, about the statistics or about the meta-analysis needed or about the Aruba study, uh, that's, uh, we would be here to tomorrow talking about all that. But uh, spectrum Martin grade one and two is a surgical disease. Uh, I have no doubt that with no respect to presentation, spectrum Martin one and two should be resected and uh, since we all have like morbidity mortality one two percent not more in these small avms we are beating the natural course in a year or two uh, another percent in morbidity mortality is another year when patient is not profiting so in this case with special martin with very low morbidity mortality you can uh, do your surgery even at uh, older patients uh, Spetzer Martin grade three, it's really individual. It's a heterogeneous group of AVMs. And those large ones on the surface are best for surgical treatment. And those uh, small ones in the depths are better for uh, radio surgery. Uh, Spetzer Martin four and five, uh, those are invariably the case cases for observation, unless uh, repeated bleeding forces you to operate or even uh, one single bleeding, it depends. But mo most likely it's repeated bleeding. And uh, in our series, this Spetzel Martin 4 
uh, from only like uh, 10% of patients, not more. Use monotherapy. That's uh, my mantra now that I really do not like any pre-surgical embolization because all with meta-analysis, you get morbidity, mortality for all three modalities, radio surgery, endovascular and uh, surgery at 7% which means that if you have AVM with three pre-surgical embolization followed by, by surgery, it's four by seven. You expose the patient to the risk of nearly 30%, which in my mind is not possible. It's too high. You then do not beat the natural course at all. But you can, of course, use some combinations of the treatment. And unfortunately, the best combination I find was never really studied. It is the surgery following failed radio surgery. The effectivity of radio surgery is something like 65%. So there is still 35% of uh, AVMs which are not treated by the uh, irradiation. And I had the opportunity to operate on four such cases after radio surgical treatment which failed. And those were four most easiest surgeries on AVMs I ever did. It's very easy, very nice. The vessels are much easier to coagulate because there is this uh, hyperplasia. It was really easy, but it never was done as a planned protocol. In the, no one did it. I don't understand why, because it's uh, quite logical with all those uh, AVMs which are treated uh, by radio surgical means. Uh, all the details and anything you would like to know about the AVMs is in this book we have published uh, two years ago uh, with uh, Andrzej Bradacz, colleague of mine, and uh, I would urge you to read it. And this is not a commercial because Springer takes the, uh, all the copyright, so you get nothing. I, I, if you will all buy it, I will get not a single penny. And this is our team and the guy who wrote the book with me is this one who looks more or less like from environmentalist services of the hospital but he's really a good good neurosurgeon right thank you for your attention brilliant and thank you Vandra uh, Vladimir um as you <coughs> alluded to yourself there's nothing we like more than tips and uh, so the surgical experience because neurosurgery is very much experience driven speciality and this is a fantastic forum to exchange our experiences. I have um, one question here from Dr. Imad Alawindi. <coughs> Excuse me, what about AVM that presents with a hematoma? How to treat? That's a quite big question. Um, that is. But if you um, have, uh, uh, or perhaps Rama's one or two tips, not not uh, not a textbook or, yeah. or, or review paper, then... Uh, that, that that is exactly the point where we are neurosurgeons and we are clinicians. So we know how to evaluate the clinical condition of the patient. And of course, any, any uh, surgery and any treatment uh, uh, protocol depends on the clinical condition of the patient. If the patient is coming in with, let's say, Glasgow coma 10, 11, and if the patient is uh, deteriorating, then definitely you must evacuate the hematoma with no respect to AVM. In some cases, if it's a large grade 4 AVM, then we would evacuate just the part of the hematoma which is distant from the AVM. And uh, we, we never saw uh, bleeding after this decompression, which is just fine. If it's a small AVM, then uh, we would go for AVM as well. It's uh, like the case I have shown. In case the patient is in a good condition uh, and not deteriorating, doing well, then we shall wait until the hematoma liquefy two, three weeks, and then we would go for surgery. So it's really individual and it really depends on the clinical condition of the patient. You Thank do not you. operate on uh, images. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Um, I, I need to uh, ask Rames to join in as well. I'm, I'm presuming it's going to be fairly similar, but we put together um, a paper um, summarizing experience with the management of uh, <clears throat> bleeding AVM. So perhaps uh, Ramos would like to say a word or two about it. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, don't do it acutely unless you have an angiogram. This is the first thing. If it is simple enough, you tackle the AVM 
at the same time, but if it's complex, don't do it in the acute stage. The problem are the ones that uh, bleed after embolization because they would not stop bleeding. The reason they, um, they bled because they occluded the veins and you will have a lot of trouble. Uh, these are the most difficult situation you will face because they are really complex AVMs. They have occluded the veins. You go to evacuate the hematoma, the AVM will bleed. The others, I agree totally with Professor Bedesh that uh, they don't, you can just evacuate the hematoma or if you don't have the courage, just do a decompressive craniectomy and leave it for later. But the value of uh, liquefying hematoma before it disappears is great. It's a great surgery. We, I've done Spessler Martin grade three and four. Uh, looks much easier because the hematoma liquefied two, three weeks, have dissected the white matter tracks away for you. It localizes the nidus easily and uh, don't let it disappear. You will regret it. This is the window of opportunity to do them in selected cases. Thank you very Ramez, much. May I, may I ask Ramez a question? Absolutely. Yes, please. Ramez, do you believe that the bleeding occludes part of the nidus and it's not seen on the original AV uh, angio? <laughs> well, but if you uh, would repeat in, angio in three weeks when the hematoma liquefies that you will see another AVM, larger or whatever like that? Do you believe it? I heard that was said a lot, but I. The answer came from uh, our neuroradiologist in uh, Cambridge who looked into all that. And in fact, he did not see much difference in the NIDAS when, uh, for patients who have two angiograms, one at the acute stage and one after the hematoma disappeared. And uh, it may not be as true as people mix, mix it up. Yeah. So it means that if you do not operate on emergency uh, basis and you you have the angiogram, and I believe that it's really fundamental what you said, that you need to have an angio, not, uh, not only CT angio or whatever. Yeah. And if you postpone surgery for three weeks, then you can use this angio for your surgery. Yeah, we use the same yeah. the initial angio, yeah. Yeah, good. Brilliant. While, uh, while uh, Professor Brogi is um, uh, sharing, uh, preparing sharing of his computer with us, I will pass the button to okay. Professor Benesh, who will... Uh, he will take you through the rest of the meeting. Yeah. Tom, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for, 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 for uh, excellent uh, sharing the session. And uh, it's it's very easy now. Johnny, the screen is yours. OK, I'm ready. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And uh, I will uh, try to share with you what I learned uh, on this uh, that is one of the most uh, neurophysiological or anatomy physiological surgery in 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 all uh, our our field so to that uh, i don't know exactly me and, and that's from the beginning and that's from now and if you want to know uh, why i became a neurosurgeon you can uh, get uh, uh, this uh, this contribution this paper uh, microvascular decompression i mean uh, the main problem of the uh, neurophysiological uh, um, disease of, of cranial nerve is uh, uh, TGM and neuralgia, the, the most, uh, the most uh, epidemiologically important. We have two techniques. One is a percutaneous one. We have also radiosurgery we see uh, at the end and uh, in the open procedure that uh, we have to talk today about the open procedure. If we have time, we will go to give some uh, 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 advice uh, for the percutaneous technique. So, uh, what we learn uh, from uh, from this kind of uh, uh, of uh, surgery? This is from Lawton, and you see here uh, for the young people that maybe are listening to us uh, in this small field that is uh, no more than 15 millimeters. You have everything from the fifth nerve to the 11 nerve and uh, and uh, and that is trigeminal neuralgia uh, and uh, functional mispasmus uh, glossopharyngeal neuralgia meniere syndrome and so and so so uh, um, sorry let's go ahead a little bit of history uh, we started with the, the lesioning from uh, from two centuries ago and uh, till the beginning the half of the last centuries with Tarnoy try to uh, propose decompression of the, of the nerve 
intradurally in the, in the Gasserian ganglion. And what was Gardner and but mainly Janetta that uh, developed the, this uh, uh, approach. This is our series. My personal series is one on the bracket. Uh, and, uh, and that is the, as I told before, the pathology that we can treat with this kind of uh, approach. Uh, the three uh, are the main one, and the, the, the last one are the less, uh, less uh, uh, easy to find. <clears throat> what is the, the pathogenic hypothesis? The hephaptic transmission among the nerve at the end zone, the fifth nerve, at the end zone of the fascial uh, nerve that is in, in the uh, protuberantial uh, 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 sulcus. And, uh, and maybe for the Meniere syndrome and in the neurology of intermediate nerve is the nerve distortion. Uh, the entry zone is very important because there is the uh, is there is a one uh, uh, characteristic: the presence of glial cell for a few millimeters before they get the real nerve, and that's maybe the reason why we have the hepatic in induction. Nevertheless, we have to understand that there is a peripheral nerve, there is conflict that gives a similar situation. Uh, this was one case uh, that we published, is about the uh, uh, anterior interosseous uh, uh, nerve. So that is something that is, can be really seen for many other nerves. Uh, the other problem is that for uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia and glossopharyngeal and the nuclei, what, I, what they play there, and we know that uh, uh, NBD is working also in multiple sclerosis, is working in a typical uh, trigeminal pain, sometimes is working, is working in trigeminal autonomic cephalangia. And that is not uh, a conflict, it's something that is, has to deal with the nuclei. So let's go uh, to the surgery. Uh, that is very important that uh, the MRI is done in a very good way and we, you can see the, uh, the conflict and uh, my, uh, my suggestion is never trust your radiologist, see with your eyes what is in this particular patient and we find out that, that sometimes you are in, dis in a disagreement with the neuroradiologist. How to do it? is a very simple uh, uh, incision uh, in the uh, retromastoid region, uh, very small, uh, is a, a, a craniotomy, is a mini or micro craniotomy. And, uh, was, and the, you found a kind of corridor because the, uh, cer the cerebellum is going down and uh, you can, uh, the surgeon can go through there without touching, without this, the, the, the destroying or damaging uh, the surface of the cerebellum. And we see what is, are the tips and tricks on down that. So positioning is very, very important because when, uh, as in, in all surgery, uh, in all neurosurgery, but in this case is very, very important because if you want to do a micro uh, craniotomy, you have to be sure that you can get to where you want to go. Uh, this is uh, the landmarks, is the uh, 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 superior, the, sagittal, the, the petrous, uh, sinus and the erythrosigmoid sinus, and you have to, they, that's for the beginners, I think it's very, very important to know where to go. Sometimes the, uh, the uh, near navigation can help you, but it's not necessary, it's an anatomical uh, 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 approach to the disease. Uh, this is, is uh, what is the summary of what I told you till now. And I think this is very important. Positioning. You see here that this, uh, we are using the prone positioning. You can also maybe use the uh, Concord position, but uh, this, or the park bench position better. But this is enough. If you uh, uh, have a, a little bit of uh, 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 mm, putting the head and they giving it, bringing down the shoulder. Uh, of course, you have, you can cut. You have to cut the muscle. Uh, you found them a, 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 a mystery mastery that that is uh, the a kind of uh, target. You know that if you get that, you are in the good position, good planning, 
I'm not doing the uh, the bore hole, um, but just making it a little by little and taking out the uh, uh, speckle of, of the the, the bone just to show the uh, superior sagittal the, the, the sagittal sinus. The, I'm sorry to the sinus, and the uh, and after the sharp dissection. That is one of the most important things uh, for the Gemini and Uraja, You have to find the the uh, tentorium. That means that we are going upward over the surface of the cerebellum. And uh, you see here, sharp dissection, no coagulation, and no retraction, because the gravity is retracting the cerebellum. And you can get to the point, the one you go, that is the, the, the trigeminal nerve. You see here the dendy vein, and we will see uh, in later on if what is the case, you can sacrifice the vein, but you have to know sometimes the anatomy before and, uh, and uh, what is most important if there is collateral drainage. In this case, you have this one, you have another vein here and, uh, and, and after, of course, you, you find the conflict, you, the artery can be manipulated in a very nice way. Uh, uh, the vein are much more fragile. Um, I'm not you. I'm not using Teflon anymore for the last ten years. Uh, no muscle, but uh, uh, surgery cell, the fibrillary surgery cell that is making in time a kind of uh, uh, arachnoiditis for the for the uh, taking out the arteries. And that's that is uh, uh, the end. Of course, this is a small vein, and because you save the big one. Uh, you can cut, you can co coagulate and cut. That is the only time in which coagulation is, let's say, allowed in this kind of surgery. Closure, uh, that is quite important. Uh, you close the, the dura, uh, you put uh, some uh, uh, dura uh, stuff and glue, and you can close everything. Uh, now let's see the, the other situation that you can find when you have uh, left a, 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 a fascial spasm. Of course, the MRI is very important. You have to understand that in, in this case, you have to go where the nerve is, uh, is coming out from the brainstem. Uh, here is the vertebral artery. And you see that the nerve is hidden by this artery that is the ICA. So you have to move the ICA, find out the, 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 the uh, fascial nerve. Of course, you can use also stimulation, but that is not so important. And at the end, uh, for the, the a fascial hemispasm, it's, it's very important to uh, put also some uh, glue to be sure that mainly the, uh, the uh, uh, vertebral artery is not coming back and pushing everything again. Uh, let's finish as in the usual way. Uh, sometimes you have you have the the uh, complex neuralgia, but from the same approach you can do both things. Again, you see here a, a large uh, petrous vein. Uh, you the sharp dissection for the nerve. Find out the conflict take out the, the conflict in this case is the big sky, it's not the, the uh, perforators. And, uh, and you manage to, let's go faster, to manage to take out the conflict on the nerve. And when you finish this part with the usual uh, solar cell, you can move to the other one. Uh, and that is downward. You see here the nerve, the the the, the, the eighth nerve, and here is the complex of mixed nerves. Again, sharply sectioned. Uh, you clean all the uh, all the nerves, and uh, sometimes you can find also the uh, a little bit of the. Uh, uh, you see here a little bit of choroid plexus, and you have you can coagulate in this case. In this case, it was not, and you put again the uh, take out, take out the 
the, uh, the conflict. And of course, at the end, you have the completely free of the ordinaries. Uh, results of this technique is, is quite good, as it's supported for many years. And uh, we will see that uh, pain relief is uh, about in 80% uh, of the patient free of medication, but we will see later on the, uh, our uh, personal results. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the, uh, the, the nerves are, are, the, uh, are, this, are the compressed or, or uh, modified in their course by uh, some other pathology. Uh, in this way, it was a micro AVM and uh, that was discovered uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by MRI. Uh, this one is DVA, you see here. This one is a small uh, meningioma. So remember that it's not the clinical situation that is very important, but MRI can help you to confirm the diagnosis. And of course, you can handle the situation. This is a typical uh, distortion of the nerve, the typical conflict uh, you see before and after the surgery. And you see here that definitely all the fibers are uh, modified in their course. And that's the theory of the fact that transmission it can be uh, sustained by this Im imaging. Uh, now, almost is done, but let's see some other, some other video just to show you uh you see here the, the to show you what tips and tricks uh, at least for young people this is the coagulation of the vein because otherwise we cannot do it and we will discuss later on when uh, it can be done only on on the visual situation or you won't be more sure and there is some uh, some some uh, tricks can then be done the most important thing is no retraction. Never try to push retractor because otherwise you can have problem with the vein, problem with the surface of cerebellum that uh, later on can, can give you uh, complication. And, uh, and always sharp dissection and no coagulation. Let's go faster because of time and also because it's is a quite rep repetitive the situation. Uh, on the left side is that was right side. Left side is is the same things. Uh, is only that uh, it changed. Most important things find out the tentorium. Uh, that's is this is uh, the petrous bone. This is the tentorium. So you have to go on top of the cerebellum. Uh, to be sure that you are not damaging the fibers and the vascularization of the eighth nerve uh, and avoid to have problem of hearing later on. And again, you see here that venous are saved and that the second conflict can be taken out. Recurrent, recurrent cases. Uh, are more or less show as the same. It's a little bit difficult to reopen the, the craniotomy, but when you open the craniotomy and you cut the dura, you get the same situation that is in virgin cases. In this case, the, uh, uh, there was a, 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 again a conflict down here, you will see. And uh, uh, I, I don't, there is no explanation why. Sometimes you can find recurrence because of a change in venous drainage, uh, but uh, usually it's just because the arteries that are like uh, uh, elastic, they co come back and they make again a contact. This is, was the case. And this at the end, again, the veins are saved. What about what to do when there is no conflict? Sometimes you uh, are confident that you find the conflict, the MRI is, is, uh, is suggesting you that, but sometimes you cannot find anything. The only thing is that you can do is careful dissection, uh, try to go around 
and we will see later on, maybe use the endoscope to see if uh, everything is clear. And, uh, and after you have, you will have some option. In this case, I put again, just to be a kind of uh, uh, psychasthenic attitude to be put something to uh, avoid further contact, but there was no contact in this case. Uh, that is quite important, uh, not only for the triple contact conflict that we found, but because we, we discussed it about closing, coagulating or not the dengue vein. So let's see. Okay, let's start, uh, go ahead. Here you have a big, huge vein. You have to decide what to do. You can do an ICG and you see that there is a, a, a only one looks like that is very important drainage that is also pulsating. You can use a, a temporary clip for aneurysm or for AVM as we saw uh, Vladimir show before. Uh, you close the vein, do again the ICG and in this case, you see there is no other way. This is a very small drainage. So this vein cannot be sacrificed. And of course, you take out the, your clip. And uh, go ahead with the uh, And the vein should be saved. This is a simple trick, quite important. Uh, are it, we, are, we are using, and I saw you the video today, till now, completely microscope without using a Nevada endoscope. That was a case of the uh, uh, fascia spasm. Uh, you see here the nerve. But when you are not sure, or when you won't be more precise, uh, you can use the endoscope. The endoscope may play a role, yes. There is a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, publication that is saying that endoscope can be used and is worth to use in endoscope assisted. Fully endoscope is another story, but it can be done. It requires a longer uh, experience on that. And I will tell you what is my opinion at the end in the conclusion. So, uh, in a, a microscope case, endoscope should be introduced when there is not conflict or where you are not sure that you, you, you get everything clear. And this is uh, one case in which there was a fascial hemispasm. put the usual way, but to be sure that everything was, was perfect, we are sticking inside the endoscope and to check if everything was what uh, was planning in advance. And of course, there is some trick uh, that, that has to be used when you introduce the endoscope. This is the, it can be done also with the fully endoscope approach. And I did some cases on that. This uh, is just, uh, uh, this are some, some uh, picture, but I would like to show you if it's possible, uh, one video and let's see if I can do it. Yes. You see here, that is full endoscopic. This is beginning, this is, there is the vein. I decide to, to close the vein and the vein can be easily coagulated. Why I close this vein? Because this is the, another drainage. So it, it can be saved to I close it. I cannot see that, I cannot. And when you have at the end, of course you can be... We, we cannot see the video, please show it again. I'm sorry. So I think that uh, we, we escape. You, you trust me. Uh, I show a lot now. I, I will show you only the, uh, the picture. Uh, this is the beginning. 
This is in, in, uh, when you are near to the nerve. Uh, this is the resolution, of, the resolution of conflict. And this at the end uh, that you can make it to I'm sorry, I, I cannot start the video. So I try to get this, uh, this trick, but it's not working. What is the message? Advantage of uh, use of endoscope. Uh, able to show missed conflict, able to configure the complete resolution of the conflict. The disadvantage is, is, the, uh, is a, a tool that is quite large for the mi mi microcraniotomy. So, uh, and in at least the beginning is increasing a little, a little the timing, but that is not so important. The most important thing is anyhow, the endoscope should be introduced under microscopic view because otherwise the risk of damage of the structure is quite high. And uh, uh, the full endoscopic resolution, the conflict required experience in the endoscopic surgery. And I think that uh, is not for young people or for the people that are not such a, such a, large, uh, a large experience. What about the results? Uh, you see here that uh, you have uh, 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 almost uh, uh, 80, 70, uh, 75 80% of very good results. Uh, and in a part of the poor case of the failure, you can do a second uh, uh, surgery because we have a recurrence also. And that's also the second surgery can be quite good. It, it, uh, also see if the results are less good than before. Probably because as in the case of multiple sclerosis, the trigeminal nuclei is playing a role and uh, has not to be undervaluated. It has to be remembered that in, for multiple sclerosis, the risk of the, the success is only in 50% of the cases, but sometimes it's worth to do it, to propose to the patient. That is the, uh, uh, the advantage, uh, disadvantage of following Janetta. Uh, and the cure rate at that time was 70%, in our series 86%. Mortality rate was very low, in our series is nil. Here, here. Complication, because you cannot make omelette without breaking the hex. CSF leak at the beginning was very quite high and with the sealant, <clears throat> the, is almost zero. I mean, is, is uh, requiring surgical repair is zero. With the 3% lumbar drainage can be useful for, for closing, uh, for uh, saving this complication. Permanent as AIDS deficit was is very low you have to tell the patient that he can have some this problem uh, and, uh, and 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 paresis of fascial uh, of fascial nerve has to be uh, put forward to the patient uh, of course there is tricks for avoid the permanent a deficit for the trigeminal neuralgia superior cerebral approach for glossopharyngeal neuralgia, uh, lateral approach, uh, as well as for, em for the fascia hemispasm. No uh, uh, sharp dissection of the aranoid, no retraction. For uh, avoid the permanent deficit, no retraction, sharp dissection again, and uh, uh, they pay attention in a case of dolicopasilar conflict, because that can be damaged in the maneuver, the sixth nerve. In case of conflict, is not cannot be found. It's not be found at the at surgery. A Burkel proposed the splitting of the nerve with very good results, and that is what I'm doing today. Uh, uh, but you can also uh, stop and do a percutaneous uh, procedure later, or radiofrequency or balloon technique, uh, at least three months after the surgery. Radio surgery can be uh, one option. You have to, uh, to uh, remember that uh, radio surgery is getting advantage for the trigeminal neuralgia or glossopharyngeal neuralgia only some months before. So if you have a status uh, of uh, a, a, a complete in, in, in unbreakable un, 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 uh, pain that is uh, 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 damage the patient if you want to have an immediate results, uh, radio surgery is not the answer. 
and therefore the uh, adult nurse uh, radiosurgeon cannot uh, do anything. Uh, when you cannot find anything in case of, of uh, facial nerve uh, spasm or uh, uh, glossopharyngeal neurology, it's better to stop the surgery and to do nothing. There is a lot of uh, contribution now for the glossopharyngeal nerve. They say it cut in the nerve. I, the only few times that I cut the nerve it was a disaster. So I am not suggesting to you. In case of venous conflict, uh, the clipping test can be a, a very good way to know if you can sacrifice the vein or not. For the uh, fascial spasm, uh, lateral approach to the cerebellum is the trick and the, uh, has to be respected the ICA because of the acoustic branch. Otherwise, you get the good results on the fascial spasm, but, but you have some uh, hearing deficit. And sometimes you have to coagulate the choroid plexus because that is the cause of uh, distortion of the nerve. An endoscope uh, is, a, is a very good way to control that you are doing very good things. For the uh, uh, CSF leak, uh, close the mastoid cell when you open it, just at the beginning of surgery, immediately with muscle and fibrin glue. Uh, at the closure of the, the craniotomy, you have to be try to close everything to be sure that there is no leak. And uh, during a surgery with the muscle or with some uh, collagen structure, put the, the uh, dura substitute, use the sealant, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and close uh, the surgery. Radio surgery is that is not a film. Uh, another time we will discuss on that. So take home message. The uh, micros microscopic <coughs> macro mini invasive mini craniotomy uh, microvascular compression remain the standard for uh, for uh, trigeminal neuralgia for all the fu functional disease of uh, cranial nerve. Uh, the uh, important things is no cerebellar retraction, both from the superior approach than the lateral approach. Gravity has to do the retraction. The endoscope is used. Uh, it is not is a tool. Is not uh, a, 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 the only way to do perform the surgery. But each surgeon uh, will choose what is the best strategy. Uh, the Foley endoscope, is, as I said, possibly is a question of generation. The young people that are playing with the, with the. Uh, with the game at the television are much more and uh, uh, have a better uh, many manual uh, visual manual strategy that uh, my generation. Uh, what is the the algorithm at the, at the best uh, and uh, what I propose to you? Uh, drug resistance you have to try before with the, with with pharmaceutical treatment. If you have side effect, the patient will just, and uh, you can def de make an MRI that is very important, or everything, uh, every way. And uh, you can have a positive uh, found that it is easy to propose and, and release. If the conflict is negative, you can do again, make a, a, a exploration, or go to uh, percutaneous procedure, or go to cyber knife. If you have not a status uh, epileptic a status uh, of trigeminal neuralgia, in recurrent situation is the same. If you find out that there is a new conflict, MVD open surgery again. If it's negative, uh, you can propose to the patient a, a percutaneous procedure or again cyber knife. Uh, these are the my team, the people that helping me, and uh, that I, I guess that today are better than me in doing this uh, kind of surgery. And I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Giovanni. It was great. Uh, there were several questions, but you have answered them uh, nearly all through your presentation. There is one from uh, Dr. Sanchez from Costa Rica. Yes. Uh, yes. What are the intraoperative finding after radio surgery. What did uh, you find? Well, there is a, the arachnoid, arachnoiditis is more and more uh, st 
tariff that uh, the usual things. But uh, I will say that the, the most important problem is the, is the uh, uh, closure of the skin, because the skin is different uh, than uh, before. I don't know why, because, because uh, as I show you, uh, the, uh, as I show you here, the, uh, the radiation is done, is done in, a, in, a, in a very, uh, oh, wait, let's see if I can find it, uh, in a very, in a spot. So I don't know why, but that is the only thing that you see, that this is the target. Uh, uh, I don't know why, but the, 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 the only problem is the closure. Okay. Uh, I have one question of my own. Yes. There are neurovascular conflicts described for all but two cranial nerves, and these are six and twelve. How come that there are no conflicts, no something like uh, hemitank uh, spasms or whatever? Do you have any explanation for these two nerves? Uh, uh, the, the, the audio was very bad. Can you repeat the question? That the neurovascular conflict yes. is described in a clinical condition for all but two nerves, six and twelve. Why? Do you have any explanation why there is something like a, Hemitank move uh, spasms or like that in 12s and something like uh, uh... well I, I have to tell you that is this there was described uh, uh, the diplopia for conflict with the megadolic opacity with the sixth and also with the turn nerve uh, so maybe that uh, is uh, the anatomical situation is different the only uh, the only explanation they can say is that I think that ninety percent of the uh, of the etiology uh, um, is due to the distortion of the nerve, ten percent if not more from the nuclei. So I think that uh, the sensory nuclei maybe are more complex uh, uh, than uh, that uh, the the let's say motor nuclei. Uh, to, to, to say that this can be the situation is that the, sometimes you have a, a hearing deficit uh, uh, just uh, be, uh, during surgery for other things in the, in the pontine angle without touching the nerve. And I think that is because the, 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 the nuclei are suffering maybe for uh, some change in, the, in vascularization. Okay. Thank you, Giovanni. We must move forward and uh, I would like to ask my very good friend and I'm looking forward to the presentation about the brainstem. Miguel Araes of Malaga. Miguel, floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon, good night, good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, Vladimir, for allowing me to start my presentation. I think that uh, over the next uh, 20 minutes, we, we, we will talk about brainstem anatomy and selection of the surgical approach. Uh, I think that uh, three um, important issues are, of course, uh, the anatomical definition of the lesion that is uh, nowadays very nicely given by MRI techniques. Of course, this is a surgical techniques that uh, uh, must include intraoperative monitoring, including for ventricle mapping. And I think that from the anatomical and surgical point of view, more and more the concept of safe, safe entry zone has been coined. We have to go through the uh, different regions if we just focus in the posterior approaches uh, to the fourth ventricle, in Pontine region, we can do a very simple occipital approach and we can find to, uh, let's say, safe entry zone. In the same way as for intramedullary tumor, we have the median sulcus and also we have the suprafacial and infrafacial triangle trying to avoid the fibers of the seven and sixth uh, nerves. Uh, we uh, can see this uh, patient. This is a, a cavernous angioma occupying the fourth ventricle area. And this is a very straightforward approach. We, we can see the cavernous angioma just uh, at the fourth ventricle. We have to follow one of the principles for cavernoma removal. First of all, uh, 
uh, debulking, and second, the key issue of this operation that is trying to find a clean plane between the lesion and uh, the normal brain tissue, as you can see here. This is the crucial point trying to avoid post-operative morbidity. And this is important to mention that sometimes we will find a very irregular lesion and sometimes some part of the tumor can be embedded inside brainstem, as you can see here, much more than we could expect. And uh, if we are not paying attention to that, we can leave behind some part of the tumor. So our aim to diminish to zero the probability of uh, brainstem uh, operation is not achieved. This is, this is not the fourth ventricle, this is the cavity after removal with some very good plane just uh, insinuating that the postoperative course of the patient is going to be good. This is the postoperative MRI. This is a, a slightly different case. This is a young patient with typical history. In two weeks, two episodes of brainstem bleeding. After the second one, comatose uh, uh, situation, the patient coming around with hemiparesis and left uh, in a six nerve palsy. You can see the lesion distorting the fourth ventricle. And this is where we can try to uh, um, use the fourth ventricle mapping, trying to identify the areas, um, sensitive areas, also trying to find midline C that's apparently due to the distortion of the tumor, uh, seems to, to, to be two uh, median sulcus. This is uh, the approach of the lesion in the way we mentioned before operation at the subacute state that, uh, in which the blood is, uh, is in the operation. And here we can see bottom right, we can see some very clean plane after removal. And you can see MRI at the left and you can see the patient after several weeks with pretty good postoperative results, some increase postoperative transient increase of hemiparesis and diplopia that uh, little, little by little improve with this uh, pretty good uh, postoperative result. If we look at the pontomedullary region, you can see the lesion here, several episodes of brainstem uh, dysfunction in a young patient. A simple retrosigmoid approach is good enough uh, just to identify the lesion. We are at the left side. This is seven and eight, this is nine and 10. Between nine and 10, we can try to find the lesion and do the microcentrical removal. And this is after, after removal of the lesion. But uh, we can see that, uh, just, that the plane is not very clean due to uh, the existence of uh, glyoptic tissue in between the lesion and normal brainstem. Postoperative MRI is fine, as you can see here. But at the postoperative, immediate postoperative period, increasing of hemiparesis, sixth nerve palsy, and dysphagia. And this is uh, something due to the very bad uh, claim, uh, and not, not a very good uh, claim, plane, and also due to the moment of the hemorrhage. We gathered that the moment of the, sorry, the moment of the uh, operation. We gathered that the very immediate postoperative period is not the best moment uh, for uh, cavernoma removal at the brainstem, nor either. Uh, when in a very late stage, we can find this not very clean plane that we are looking for trying to, to get a, a better result. If we go to the Fontaine region, but the ventral aspect, we have two safe entry zones. This is the peritrigeminal area, very well described thus far. And also we have the exit between uh, fifth and seventh nerve, let's say over here, as uh, a second safe entry zone for the anterolateral um, uh, placed um, cavernomas. And this is the anatomical explanation. And uh, I'd like to take advantage to, to thank uh, Pablo Gonzalez and his team for just allowing me to show this wonderful anatomical preparation from his uh, three anatomy group in Alicante. Congratulations, Pablo. And we can see very well the corticospinal tract that has this loosened distribution at the anterolateral aspect of the pontine region. This is the exit of the fifth nerve, and this is the uh, this is the pontine region. 
and this is the peritrigeminal area. Peritrigeminal area is a safe entry zone, and uh, that way we can get inside trying to remove the lesion. We can get this area through presigmoid approach, transpitous approach, or retro, simple retrosigmoid approach. See this patient operated on uh, years ago, and you can see fifth nerve, you can see the, the lesion over here. We can discuss about uh, which possibility for operation. Of course, uh, uh, for the ventricle could be one, but uh, we try to avoid in as much as possible the entrance through the uh, fourth ventricle. In this case, the presigmoid approach is giving also a very straight avenue to the lesion. And this is the way through the presigmoid avenue cutting tentorium. This is labyrinthine block, and this is the way of exposing uh, fifth nerve and the dandy complex of veins. As you can see here, this is the fifth nerve. I will move forward. And the easy way to enter brain stem, unlike supratentorial region, you have to make some small incision that is elongated and opening, trying to elongate the fibers instead of cutting them. And following the principle of cavernoma resection, the lesion was completely removed. And you can see the nice post-operative MRI insinuating the way we just took advantage of this, uh, of this safe entry zone. This is another patient, anterolateral aspect of the pontine region, a big cavernoma lesion. This is right side, this is fifth nerve, this is seventh nerve. In this case, we took advantage of, of this uh, safe uh, entry zone. And I have to mention that more and more we have been using this very simple and very useful classical press, uh, retrosigmoid approach to remove lesion like this one. You can see the way we can make this a small opening that is uh, elongated, uh, clot is evacuated, and you can see the very easy way of removing the lesion, clean plane at the deepest part of the cervical field, and a very nice post-operative uh, MRI, unfortunately, very good post-operative course, as I mentioned before, by means of this classical and very simple approach. We are using retrosigmoid approach for the anterior lateral frontine region in many cases. You can see this is a different one. This is a patient with uh, uh, multiple cavernous angioma. See this big one, that has uh, a very irregular shape, gliotic areas, different stages of hemorrhage. In summary, not an easy case, but fortunately very easily removed through a retrosigmoid approach. This is uh, uh, seven and eight, and eight, fifth over there, complete removal. And this is postoperative MRI. You can imagine that the lesion, the lesion was not very easy to be removed. But by means of this approach, and this is the safe entry zone, the lesion was completely removed. You can see the, the, the patient um, at the initial postoperative uh, stage, also a slight uh, uh, facial palsy. And this is the patient months later, a, a clip sent from his uh, uh, residency far from Malaga. As an, an, at the right side, this very satisfactory MRI. And if we move uh, to the next uh, step, we will move to the mesencephalon. And if we try to find out where we could get inside the anterolateral or ventrolateral mesencephalon, the only really safe entry zone is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. This is something over there. Sometimes you can take advantage of that uh, by means of subtemporal uh, route. But for anterolateral lesion, very easily, you can use the COC approach that we actually uh, have uh, reduced to this very small and limited zygomatic osteotomy because in our understanding, the only usefulness of this approach is allowing you to reflect downward temporal muscle and diminishing the, retractor, the retraction of the uh, uh, temporal lobe. This is the way of uh, reconstruction. This is uh, not a a time-consuming procedure. And this is a young patient, 16 years old, with a, a left he progressive hemiparesis. See the lesion over here, solidocystic lesion, 
mainly involving mesencephalon, and this is the way you can uh, uh, go. And this is right tentorium, tentorial incisura. This is the right carotid artery, pecan. This is by definition, posterior uh, cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery in between the third nerve and the way you can follow one of the principles of uh, brainstem surgery that is trying to get the lesion where the lesion is abutting uh, the most at the pial surface. This is the postoperative MRI, very nice, small staining, no tumor, but the patient became immediately after uh, completely hemiplegic. And uh, see the patient four months after the operation with pretty good uh, removal. The patient is a piano player and uh, nine months after he sent uh, from his uh, uh, town this uh, very nice uh, clip showing him playing piano. I think there are two conclusions for that. First of all, sometimes the initial postoperative uh, result can be disappointing, but uh, and mainly in young patient, this kind of operation is very rewarding. Second conclusion for this case, we again, a very nice picture from uh, Dr. Gonzalez's uh, lab. You can see the corticospinal tract at the pontine region and see at the mesencephalic region. At the mesencephalic area, all the tracts are very, are very compact and very easily when you manipulate over here, you will have a, 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 a terrible postoperative deficit. So take uh, a lot of care when uh, managing the anterolateral aspect of the mesencephalon. This is another patient, see this lesion. The patient uh, came with a sudden episode of tetraparesis and gait uh, imbalance and lack of coordination. We just wait and see because uh, this lesion, we assume that would be a very difficult one. The patient came back later on with another episode that didn't respond to corticosteroid and we decide to go uh, uh, and operate the patient. Which way? You can imagine this one, this is not a very good one. You, you have here at the anterior and medial aspect, you have basilar uh, uh, artery and you have all the perforator, not very good uh, approach. But if you look at this picture, you can identify the uh, infracolicular safe entry zone of one possibility to remove this complex mesencephalic tumor. And this is what we, what we do by means of a simple uh, trans-tentorial uh, suboccipital approach. See here the fourth nerve, due to the distortion of the tumor, very uh, seldom we can see the exit of the fourth nerve in our operation. And here we can see after cutting of the tentorium, right side, of course, see some staining over here, just uh, leading us to the, uh, to the lesion. Let's move to the next one. Small opening, elongating fibers. This is infracolicular uh, safe entry zone. Move just to, to this one. And this is uh, a very frightening uh, picture because after removal of the lesion, a bleeding one, what we could see at the, at the deepest part is the bifurcation of basilar artery. So we had, following the tumor, completely transect uh, mesencephalon. And here at the right bottom, you can see inferior collicular area. This is inferior collicular due to the distortion. And this is the view of the surgical field after removal of the tube. This is a, a postoperative MRI. I have to mention that the patient had a, a, a bleeding at the, at the immediate postoperative uh, period, becoming comatose. We took the patient to the operating room, removed uh, the clot, and the patient came, came round, and this is the frightening MRI with uh, the postoperative MRI result. The patient now is uh, disabled, as uh, unfortunately was before the operation, due to the tetraparesis, but uh, mainly due to the uh, lack of uh, coordination. But the patient is alive and the lesion is removed. And uh, we were wondering what kind of lesion and see the histology melanocytic tumor that is a benign tumor. 
And this is uh, something I'd like to, to comment. Uh, we assume that the main histologies are in kids, uh, glioma, adults, cavernoma. There are several uh, series uh, just gathering many publications and uh, stating that uh, globally, no less than 10% of the lesion inside brainstem are not even tumor, and among the tumor, there is a huge proportion of tumor that are not initially suspected anatomy in spite of the modern spectroscopy techniques and, and things like that. So my comment is in favor of more and more removing, if indicated, or at least biops uh, the lesion at the, at the brainstem. Last part of my presentation, in regard to the posterior mesencephalon, we will avoid talking about entrances, entrances and safe entry zone at, at the medullary region because of time, uh, time constraints. And uh, we can see uh, this lesion in a patient, a third episode of diplopia. And you can, this is a sex, it was a 62 years old patient. See the lesion over here. How to approach that very easily? Through uh, another transtentorial suboccipital approach, cerebellum mesencephalis sulcus. You can see here disaster artery feeding the tumor and giving the explanation why many uh, cavernomas are, are bleeding uh, so much in, in a so. Two minutes, Miguel. Thank you. I'm just uh, finishing. And uh, you can see the very straightforward way of remove completely in total remove the lesion. This is uh, the patient in the immediate postoperative period. And my last example, this is the mesencephalon. This is not anterior, this is not posterior. This is the most difficult uh, location at the mesencephalon. And here we have to take into account really the lateral mesencephalis sulcus and see uh, one of the publication, how to get there. You can use the sub lateral supracerebellar infratentorial approach. It means you have to do a sacoccipital approach, exposing the sinuses. You have another to, ma to make another uh, craniotomy, allowing you to lift up the tentorium. And this is our case, right side, Bermian region. We have to cut from uh, underneath, from inside tentorium, allowing you to reflect and retract occipital lobe and giving the lateral angle able to get the lateral mesencephalic sulcus in this uh, occasion uh, pointing out by the mesenkef lateral mesencephalic vein as you can see here this is cerebellar uh, superior cerebellar artery after the mesencephalic uh, segment and this is the lesion very nicely exposed by means of this approach and completely removed, as you can see here. Histology, pilocytic astrocytoma. A spectroscopy was pointing out a, a malignant tumor. Another case at the same location, also a spectroscopy, malignant tumor. See this funny vessel and the way of removing, same approach. This is the postoperative uh, MRI and uh, histology, vascular malformation. The lesion was bleeding quite a lot in this delicate area. It was a very bad time and, uh, for us, but fortunately we managed to remove the lesion. And this is the patient with some postoperative deficit, getting better little by little, sorry. And, uh, sorry. and this is uh, uh, a very nice uh, view of the, of the situation. Last example, if I may say in 15 seconds, patient sent because of progressive dysphagia, diagnosis, cavernomatose lesion, and also this uh, mass effect uh, lesion uh, at the medullary area. We just uh, evaluate the patient, see the cavernomatose lesion, bleeding inside, not outside the cavernomatose lesion, so not the indication for surgery. Situation at the red nucleus, very sensitive area. We have to take care and explanation coming from the physical examination. This is palatal myoclonus. That is uh, pathognomonic of this uh, situation. Hypertrophic olivary degeneration, in this case, uh, secondary to the interruption of the dentato rubral olivary pathway. 
due to the cavernoma. In summary, and this case is just uh, for the youngest colleagues in the, in the audience, uh, just uh, stating that you have to make a very careful selection of the patient. You have to uh, very uh, carefully analyze the clinical situation. In this case, symptoms didn't come from any tumor, any malignant glioma or things like that, but came from this anatomical, physiological situation. And in summary, there, is, there wasn't an indication for surgery. So my last comment, of course, to insist in how important the current anatomical uh, images given by MRI are for this uh, um, operation. Very important to go to the anatomy and go to uh, the concept of safe entry zone for operations at the, safe, at the uh, brainstem. We have to make the choice of the best surgical approach that sometimes, even now in the time of endoscopy, I am very much in favor of endoscopy, but uh, nowadays we still have to uh, control and master the classical skull-based technique. We didn't talk about uh, uh, medullary approaches, but sometimes we have to do an extreme lateral transcondylar approach to remove anterolateral lesion at the, at the medullary region. And of course, we have to be a master in the microsurgical technique, uh, always, uh, you know, the queen when talking about neurosurgery. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to participate in this wonderful webinar. And I didn't want to finish without congratulating uh, uh, very much Imad Kanan, Vladimir Venes, and Pablo Gonzalez for the outstanding uh, job they have been doing uh, just uh, leading the near anatomy uh, WFNS committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, we are not left with much time, uh, but uh, this would be a general remark to all the lecturers. Open the Q&A and chat section of the net and answer the questions which are there, please. It's a few words, write something. And Miguel, I shall uh, ask you only one question from the floor. What is the timing for cavernoma after the bleeding? And make it short, please. Well, yes, uh, difficult question, difficult question. Never, never, never has a, a very good answer. We just um, gathered that first, the immediate uh, postoperative period after hemorrhage is not the best moment because the patient is in a bad condition sometimes and you have a higher risk of leaving behind some part of the cavernoma. We have been, we have been done in some cases due to the clinical condition of the patient, a difficult experience because the lesion was bleeding like a real AVM. Second, we gather that uh, patient that have many episodes uh, of bleeding, irregular lesion, are good candidate for surgery, but you will find this difficulty of the gliotic plate. We gathered that the best moment could be weeks after the bleeding. And uh, but okay. thank you, Miguel. Please answer the questions which are on the chat. And uh, now I would like to go forward because we are a little bit late. Uh, we have uh, now my co-chair in this moderation, Thomas Santarius, with the overall approach. Tom. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> this is going to be a um, little bit of a uh, anatomical and focused um, talk. Um, this it can be used in approaches to cavernous malformations. Um, in fact, it's only minority of them that we will approach through the floor of the fourth ventricle. <coughs> but um, a lot of other particular tumors, particularly in children, um, happen around this area. and because it's such a common and useful yet uh, commonly misunderstood approach, I thought it would be worth going through it. And um, I'd like to pay my tribute to uh, Dr. Roton and would like to quote um, um, his um, statement that I put on the wall in his office to make the delicate, awesome and faithful work of a neurosurgeon more accurate, gentle and safe. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge um, uh, Professor Ribas, as well as Ramez on the background of uh, a Cambridge college some time ago, and, uh, and you may want to read uh, all of the gentlemen's books. 
With regards of this particular talk, I would recommend this book um, from which um, I have taken a number of uh, illustrative anatomical uh, dissections. Many of them were done by Dr. Yagmurlu. Now, why do we need to know uh, all there is to know um, about uh, how to get into the bank and particularly how to get into the safe, but also how much money to take and how uh, to get out without getting caught. Um, we, we've heard of the various approaches uh, to the brainstem and uh, we'll <coughs> excuse me, focus um, on this suboccipital approach. Um, and in fact, um, one subspecific midline suboccipital version of the approach in order to expose the fourth ventricle and deal with whatever lesion we have to deal with. So let's understand fourth ventricle. Well, fourth ventricle is, well, ventricle means a room um, in, in the Roman villas, as I'm sure Professor Brogi would uh, um, say it's true. So the fourth ventricle is the last chamber, the last room before the CSF leaves the intraaxial uh, ventricular space uh, through the foramen Magendi into the cisterna magna and uh, through foramen alushka into the cerebello uh, pontine and cerebello medullary in particular cisterns. The fourth ventricle has floor, roof, and lateral recesses, and uh, we'll go through that um, in, in more detail because it's worth knowing what is around the lesion that we're dealing with. Um, primarily, the surgery is not about carvanoma, it's not about tumor, it's about the patient. And um, brainstem is an important part of the patient, um, which hopefully will leave intact, will get in, get the money, get out without damaging the whole uh, street. So um, the floor of the fourth ventricle pretty much has um, most of uh, the cranial nerve nuclei and connections underneath. And it's, it's worth to have some sort of scheme. Um, so it's the upper third, middle third, and inferior third. The upper third of the ventricle is triangular shape, and it's kind of um, pretty much from the um, entrance into the aqueduct superiorly to the upper part of um, Fram and Lushka, which is kind of this way, and to, we'll understand more and more as we go through the talk. And the inferior triangle is uh, from um, obex or the calamus scriptorius here until the upper um, uh, attachment of the tila choroidea onto the um, um, lateral aspect of the um, cerebral floor, particularly the beginning of the inferior cerebral bidancula, but we'll be talking about it uh, later on. So <clears throat> In the midline, we've already heard that we have um, the median sulcus, and, and there is nothing particularly magical about the median sulcus. It's not, not really a place that we can um, just open um, because, it's, because it's there. Uh, it's important to realize that right next to the median sulcus uh, run all the fibers that connect um, um, horizontal um, eye movement, yeah, so that there is a, there's a nucleus around sort of here, um, paramedian reticular formation, which then connects with a, a facial nucleus deeper down um, and, um, and um, sends fibers to all the ocular motor um, nuclei um, in the midbrain. So, and, and it's, it's running right next to the uh, median sulcus. So pretty much if we, uh, right underneath the ependema, so if we um, play with it, we <coughs> end up with internuclear ophthalmoplegia, we damage on both sides, very complex um, eye movement problem that pretty much is going to stay with the patient uh, for the rest of his or her life, and it's, it's, it's uncorrectable. So it's worth keeping this in mind when we're planning the bank robbery. So then we have um, the uh, collateral sulcus or sulcus limitants. And between the 
um, median sulcus and sulcus limitans, we have most of the uh, motor nuclei lined up, including facial nucleus and um, hypoglossal nucleus, and then the uh, dorsal vagal in, in nuclei. So it is also worth having some sort of uh, organization of that. In the median part, um, we have uh, vestibular nuclei and cochlear nuclei, dorsal and ventral. The cochlear, the cochlear nuclei are slightly more laterally. Um, the other sort of feature that is, is worth knowing is uh, superior fovea and knowing the boundaries of the superior fovea, um, at least roughly, is also worth knowing because the uh, superior lateral boundary of the superior fovea is made by superior cerebral peduncle, which um, we'll be talking about um, a bit more later on. Um, at the apex uh, of the superior fovea, um, if we, <coughs> excuse me, connect the apices um, with a line, and um, then we can see where the facial colliculus is. I mean, now, for example, on this picture, although it's not 3D, we can pretty much make up the facial collicula here, but sometimes it's not as obvious. But uh, maybe there will be the superior fovea that will be more obvious. So it's nice to have various um, um, ways of identify what's going on. Uh, on this picture, which is kind of a lateral view, um, it, it, we, we can again see the median sulcus here. We can see the um, sulcus limitans and laterally, and we can see the motor nuclear column running right in the middle. That's the inferior fovea here. And again, that's the superior fovea, triangular superior fovea. So um, we'll know that if we connect this apex with this apex here, the underneath the line in the medial eminence, which is, which is this um, column called here, we'll have facial colliculus here. Um, now, we have this uh, stria medullaris ventricli corti in Latin or stria piccolomini, uh, which are always very dominant feature here. And so uh, lots of people are wondering why they're there, you know, what sort of fibers are running underneath. They're usually asymmetrical as well. So th this picture from a paper, I can't remember, this is like a 1940s or even, even older paper. You can see the black and white illustration here. So, so these are the fibers running from the arcuate nuclei, which is which is kind of at the very um, sort of tip of uh, pond stroke medulla, and they run in the midline, and they go on the other side and run into um, the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncle, which is here. That that the same sort of system as the pontal cerebellar fibers. So nothing nothing um, um, necessarily magical um, about it. This picture is here to, for us to realize um, what's underneath kind of uh, when we look at it from the top, but also how deep in the brainstem the various lesions are. So we can see the facial colliculus here, and we all know that the actual prominence here is not really caused by the nucleus of the facial nerve, which is, which is deep down, um, but um, by the nerve fibers that wrap around. We'll, we'll see it on, on the dissections a bit more um, uh, better later on. We can see uh, the hypoglossal, we can see the um, hypoglossal nucleus, we can see the um, nucleus ambiguous, um, and this is this is the nuclei from, <coughs> from which um, hypoglossal nerve fibers come, so that control um, the um, bronchial uh, muscles such as um, muscles of the palate um, and throat and so on. So they are responsible for or helping us with speech swallowing and protection of airway. So uh, it is not very common when we play on the surface of the um, flow of the fourth ventricle that will cause that. It usually happens um, when, we, when we damage um, the nerve roots of the hypoglossal nerve uh, particularly bilaterally, but even unilaterally. But of course, depending how deeply a particular lesion um, on the floor of the fourth ventricle goes, we can we can cause damage of that. So if you look at it medial laterally, oh, I've forgotten to say that you know here will be 
the superior um, fovea and in the um, um, sort of superior aspect of it, just underneath the superior medulla velum, we will find the main motor in nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. And the facial is, is uh, deep down um, around the abducens um, and the facial fibers will be running around here. Then we have the salivatory nuclei um, for um, nine um, and 10. And um, here is the nucleus ambiguous, the, the main um, sort of, um, part of the um, vagus nerve that we're concerned about. And um, on, on the right side, we have the uh, sensory nuclei, uh, nucleus structus solitarius, and, and then the principal sensory uh, nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. As, as we know, the, the facial sensation is in the mesencephal mesencephalic nucleus and tract, and then the pain attempter running downwards in the spinal um, nucleus. So let's have a look at some, some dissections now that we know how it works. So that's your um, abducens nucleus, and that's your proximal and distal um, loop of the facial nerve. <coughs> Here is again the median sulcus, and just, just lateral to that and very superficially run fibers of the medial longitudinal fasciculus that, that I mentioned earlier, um, that connect the uh, um, reticular uh, um, formation of the median uh, uh, paracentral uh, pontine um, reticular formation, the um, deep down located um, facial nerve, uh, uh, sorry, abducens nucleus and uh, the nuclear oculomotor nuclei in the mesencephalon. Um, here, once we are um, talking about this dissection, we can see um, the trigeminal nerve here. So, so again, that's the facial colliculus here. Here is our uh, superior fovea, and here would be somewhere located deep to that, the principal motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, i.e. here, and the fibers then join the trigeminal nerve coming anteriorly um, from, the, um, from the pons and central tegmental tract, which we're not going to particularly spend too much time on it. We already said that um, hypoglossal um, nucleus would be located about here. Um, the vagal nucleus um, would be here, but we're talking about the dorsal vagal nucleus. And dorsal vagal nucleus is the, is the bit that controls um, um, the heart um, and um, um, cardiovascular sort of systems and, and gastrointestinal system. Generally, if, if we were to damage it unilaterally, not a lot would happen. Pretty much nothing would happen. If we, of course, uh, damaged this area and this area really badly, it, this could have fatal uh, consequences. So um, we're right not to um, fool around uh, in this area uh, too much. So um, there's again this area, if we kind of zoom in, we can see what we talked about. That's the actual nucleus of the seventh nerve. That's the proximal loop, distal loop. And that's the um, abducens nerve with its fibers going straight forward to come out on the anterior aspect of the, um, of the pons. And this is again the um, spinal uh, tract of, of the... Um, um, of the of the <coughs> excuse me trigeminal nerve and that's the trigeminal nerve going forward to come out um, from the um, pontum medullary junction. Um, we have already seen that it's just perhaps a little bit more lateral again facial nucleus if you're interested exactly where it is and that's that's your right sided um, MLF that's your left sided MLF. You, you play with it, the patient will have diplopia, full stop. Um, again, to sort of appreciate this facial colliculus um, superior um, fovea, but it, with the interest of time, I'll move on. Perhaps just to, just to point out again the, um, 
sort of sections, which is which is often good to to realize how deep certain things are. So again, acute nuclei, that's your stria medullaris, uh, uh, ventricular quadriceps columni, and uh, just out of interest, the the um, ambiguous is about here. So we're, we're now at the um, um, so lower medulla ambiguous of the um, so lower medulla stroke pons uh, would be would be about here. So there, there's the olive with various accessory olivary nuclei, and ambiguous is about here. So that's the that's the uh, tracheostomy um, peg uh, disaster zone, right? Um, just out of interest, that's your hypoglossal nucleus, it's right up, um, right next to the midline, and dorsal vagal nucleus. Again, if it's damaged unilaterally, probably not a big deal would happen. Control of cardiovascular system in particular. So uh, we talk about lateral walls now, and uh, um, lateral walls inferiorly are caused um, formed um, and pretty much. Um, by um, inferior medulla velum, which we'll talk about with the roof, and um, in the superior half by the inferior um, cerebellar peduncle. So let's talk about peduncles. So this is a superior <coughs> cerebellar peduncle. Ram has already showed this slide, and we can see um, the uh, so superior cerebral peduncle, as you know, is main output from the cerebellum, from the cerebellum going upwards. Um, towards the um, 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 telencephalon, um, and the output comes from the nuclei of uh, the cerebellum, which this big one is um, uh, our dentate nucleus. Remember the mnemonic, don't eat greasy foods, yeah? So dentate, globose, uh, fusiform, and emboliform uh, nuclei of the cerebellum. So that's the superior uh, cerebral peduncle. Um, if we add to it, which has been removed, superior medulla velum and close the hole here, we will have uh, the roof uh, complete there. So there's a view from, from the lateral, again, dentate nucleus and the outflow fibers going in the upper part of the roof, in the lateral aspect of it, into the midbrain, and then just go in front of the aqueduct and, and the cross in the Tom, two um, minutes, Tom. two minutes. Oh my gosh! So we need to speed up a little bit. Um, just showing that's the middle cerebral peduncle, and it's the inferior cerebral peduncle, that's the superior cerebral peduncle on a on a cross section. So it's really the superior cerebral peduncle and inferior cerebral peduncles that form the lateral wall. Um, I think we will just skip the embryology now and um, and just. Uh, uh, discuss the some of the parts of the roof, which is which is the essence of what we want. Um, so, if we're looking um, from um, posterior, there's the the dorsal part of the neural uh, tube has nothing here; it's been completely perforated. Higher up, it has telacoroidea, which is the junction of the ependyma and uh, pia. Um, higher up. There's a bit of neural tissue, which is the inferior medullary velum, and it, which, which connects the nodulus with the flocculus. So we can all open it, and once we open it, we have uh, entrance to the uh, floor of the fourth ventricle. I'll skip that. Um, the uh, vascular anatomy, um, as relevant as it is, and uh, just um, just take you through how um, I do this uh, surgery on the, on the fourth ventricle. So uh, usually in prone position, and it's important to uh, fix the head in the um, mostly atlanto occipital joint, which will not only open the um, foramen magnum C1 uh, part, but also will allow us to look down into the fourth ventricle better. So we have um, various uh, maneuvers to do. So um, we there's a flexion in the atlanto occipital joint. There's a, additional flexion in the neck and then we elevate the whole patient into kind of towards the sitting position as Professor Kanan uh, mentioned and of course we always strap the patient uh, if we operate from one side mostly we'll position the patient a little bit asymmetrical which is kind of um, for our back if you operate from from this area here so 
if we do the craniotomy, make it a bit smaller. So just, just the blue area and um, open the cerebellar vermian fissure, uh, which actually really we can do and do during surgery. About a minute about can be very deep and, um, and basically it will open the whole fourth ventricle to us. If, if it's okay, I'll do this quick video, which actually shows it on, on, on the patient. I'll skip this story yes, please. of the video. And so we have feet here, that's the, the head here, spreading um, tonsils. And you can start seeing the, um, um, in, uh, the, the um, tila choroidea, which we can cut with the, with the um, um, choroid plexus in it. So all the vessels that come off pica here, um, choroidal vessels, so we can, we can um, um, bipolar and cut them all. We can do it on both sides. And it will start, it will start opening the fourth ventricle um, very nicely for you. So once, once you've done that, we can see um, all the way up to the aqueduct. So now we've changed the orientation. These are feet are here, aqueduct is here. The aqueduct is plastered uh, with the tumor, but you can see how a great view you get. You have um, all the way um, in to, the, to the aqueduct. So, that's the aqueduct and that's the posterior commissure as we discussed. Now we'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, would, would please ECA prepare and uh, I hope you can ask, uh, answer the questions on chat or Q&A, Tom. Yeah. If, if there are any, uh, especially the burning ones. Uh, ECA, are you ready? Yeah, ready. Okay. So, so the next lecture is Eka Vagyve Pramono of uh, Jakarta. Eka, please. Thank you very much, Vladimir. And I will go very quick. It's just the last, everybody tired. And my friend Miguel will talk already. And I just continue while you talk. And Tom clearly explained to us about the anatomy of the fourth ventricle. So we are so stressful in Indonesia and then we need uh, refreshing, go to the Komodo. Next time you come with me to Komodo. Okay, so brainstem cavernous angioma. We just need to understand the characteristic. This is a vascular anomaly that presents a sinusoidal-like capillary vessels and regarded as neoplastic. And uh, most of the cases, uh, location is fossa posterior and mostly in the pons. So this is our cases of handling cavernoma. And this is the anatomy already clearly uh, explained by Miguel. I don't need to repeat. And we just want to see where is the safe area if we need to approach from posterior. Because again, cavernoma is always sometimes mandatory from the anterior or anterolateral and sometimes mandatory for the posterior, but sometimes in the gray area. Gray area means that you may approach from the posterior, you may approach from the and lateral or anterior. Both has a positive and negative sides. And again, you need to understand where is the surface area to go. So uh, this is the complication we need to understand that we should not injury the tract or nuclei in the brainstem and cause complication. And also the surgical indication, we need to know the exopathic evacuation, rapid progressive neurological deterioration, mass effect, and also multiple debilitating hemorrhage is indication. So which approach again, anterior or posterior? Again, both there are a positive or negative. So sometimes the anterior, we need to avoid direct upright again to the nuclei or the tract, because when we injure that, may cause another 
neurological deficit. And also uh, in the anterior, the negative thing is the window is quite narrow compared with posterior, because posterior, when we go posterior, we can have a very wide angle to see everything more clear. So if we uh, meet the rupture of the cavernous angioma, what's happening? So if the rupture is inside the tumor, so the, two, the, the patient come to us, it's like a mass evac. So sometimes you know that uh, the bleeding come out from the weak wall of the, the capsule and make a creating so-called a halo sign. You can see here, this is a very clear halo sign. And this is need to be understood to all of the colleagues where to refer to neurosurgeon because halo sign means there is the best time to remove. I will explain later to you. Uh, so again, halo, halo sign, this is a case of uh, other, other patient who came with me already three months after bleeding. Means that the halo sign disappeared already. You can see here, this is becoming, be, becoming not clear. Of course, still surgery the answer, but the tactic is completely different and much more complicated because everything attacks, reattacks to the normal uh, brain tissue. This is the mixed density appearance. You can see here layers here, meaning just bleeding a couple of times. This was, I mean, the debilitating multiple uh, hemorrhage inside this indication to do something surgery. So this is after surgery and then one year after surgery. This is so acute, you can see here. This is also indication to do surgery as soon as possible. And also when the patient get a severe neurological deficit, mostly the cases in the middle. So that means uh, we need to consider to do it as soon as possible in the medulla. So sometimes bleeding only remains small lesion and sometimes we just need to observe. So this is a, some cases I'm going to show to you that this is the, the first case I did 2001 in Indonesia of the brainstem covers and duma. So again, this is so-called a halo sign. This 23 years old male with a quadriparesis and paralysis multiple nerve. And again, when you see this halo signs, means there is like a oil, like a oil around the cavernoma capsule. So once we, we touch the capsule, it means that we can easily remove. We will show you uh, the photo, this is the patient and these poor people. And from that case, we built so-called the Indonesia Brain Foundation to help the poor people who has a good prognostic. So patient with the prone position, and again, I select this uh, uh, prone position, posterior approach. And you can see here, this is a very old video. <laughs> so see, that is the bonds, the, the positive good from the posterior, you can see huge angle. So you can see after splitting, we can see directly the cavernoma that once we touch, we pull the capsule. You can see here, actually I did it unintentionally. Just pull it just like a baby born. Why? Again, because this is a, a, a halo sign. Because the capsule covered by oily. So that's when we pull out, pull out totally. Again, well, it's, it, it's quite rare we can see here, but again, we need to teach the young generation. When we see the halo sign, that is the best time. Do not wait. Because again, when we, we wait, halo sign is, will disappear means that the karma will reattach to the normal brain tissue. And of course, this is more difficult. So this is post up. And you can see here, this is a uh, halo sign and the last the unclear halo sign. And clear halo sign, of course, also surgery, but you see, we cannot remove as the former case because we need to uh, piecemeal surgery because already reattached. <clears throat> so this is another case of a uh, female with a hemiparesis with a fourth uh, nerve palsy and we did surgery. You can see here, this is quite huge uh, cavernoma and uh, we did it already with uh, subtentora trans uh, tentoria. So this is a small cavernoma you can see in the ponto medullary junction. And again, this is not a difficult case. We just need a good microscope, prone position. You can see that 
There is like a yellowish area, means a hemosiderin there. And then just clearly, and because this is located with a superficial, you can remove uh, without any problem. You can see this is the uh, movement of the eyeball after surgery. And there's similar case uh, located in the ponto medullary junction, but deeper, deeper and more in the, in the middle eye. You can see even similar, but the effect is different. So I see we, we, we also again approach from the uh, posterior approach, and you can see here. <clears throat> so after removal, everything okay, but slightly six nerve palsy after the surgery. So this is uh, uh, another case of pontine cavernous angioma. You can see here uh, bleeding inside the tumor. You can see here. And I still prefer posterior approach for this gray area. You can see there's a medullary stria very clear because the white angle just split in the center because if you don't see any landmark split in the center. And this is again the carbonoma. This is a young lady. And again, the prognostic should be very good. Then we remove totally piecemealy. You can see here, finally, total removal is the target of the uh, carbonous angioma. You can see here, uh, we can totally remove just coverings, uh, research the dura. This is post MRI. You can see here, and again, this is a young uh, girl. Uh, 10 days after surgery, still plagia in the left uh, extremities. But one month later, you see recover very soon because again, in children is more indication. So this is the pontine cavernous angioma if the bleeding inside the capsule. So this is a subacute rupture pontine multiple cavernous angioma. The young boy came to me. You can see there. There already all the multiple layer means of bleeding many times in this boy. And if you can see clear, actually in the anterior also another cavernoma. But when we, he came to me, we decided to remove the big one in the posterior uh, with the prone position. So again, this is typlopia, a difficulty to, to walk. You can see here, uh, you, we will meet the bleeding first, then the cover of later. So it's not so difficult. Again, the posterior approach, uh, splitting the knees uh, about one third lower will, will not a problem. We don't have any case of nudism during splitting the vermis. Because again, when we do not split the vermis, mean we need to retract uh, uh, more stronger. And I prefer to split, then retraction is not much. And again, we can see very clear. So again, this is the boy we can remove totally. And then uh, he came to me, he played basketball. And uh, later on, he is, I think, going now in, in UK for study. So this is a case of exopitic medulla. Of course, this is also not a big problem. So we do a posterior approach. You can see here, we need to open until the C1. You can see very clear here, there is a lower cranial nerve. There is like a, <clears throat> all of the vessel are here. And you can see this is the yellowish exopitic carbonoma. Then we just need to dissect clearly from the surrounding area. Then again, total removal is the target of the cavernous angioma. You can see you, this is in the medulla, but because this is uh, exopitic, means that we shall not interrupt the medulla too much. So the effect is not bad, and the patient um, woke up clearly uh, without any paralysis, just one day in the ICU. So this is after removal of the lesion. So this is 40 years old male with hemiparesis and lower cranial neuropathy. Again, this is the, the mass is in the medulla. Medulla is completely different with the approach in the pons. We know that medulla just maybe about one third uh, smaller than pons. And the medulla, many nuclei, lower cranial nerve, all there. So means uh, manipulating medulla has, uh, will have a more severe deficit. So in my experience, uh, after medulla operation, the patient will have a tube, couple of weeks and sometimes couple of months. I get also another experience from Japanese college, the same, because medulla, even we approach as smooth as possible, but we still touch the 
uh, lower cranial nerve and cause uh, dysphagia and difficult to swallow. So again, this is the anatomy already explained by Thomas. And you can see here prone position, there's a midline approach. So because uh, the cavernoma is located not from the superficial, but beneath, then we need to strictly midline approach, go down, then we can find cavernoma is there. And again, very, very delicate approach because medulla very small and then here over there so many nuclei and remember every manipulation will cause uh, mostly lower cranial nerve palsy and again expectedly actually temporary you can see how terrible if the patient get a permanent uh, lower cranial palsy that we can swallow maybe long uh, in the long life so again, this is after slowly piecemeal, delicate, very tiny uh, equipment to remove the, the mass in the medulla. So again, completely different. So he used a tube two months after surgery. Fortunately, we can remove the tube two months after surgery. Still fortunately. Uh, then, uh, so this is the post-op MRI. So this is a rupture of the midbrain cavernoma. Again, this is the approach is not so difficult. We use a subtemporal, transtentorial approach, and we go just go there. It's not so much problem because the lesion also, there's a hemosiderin surrounding the lesion. So this is not a case uh, like a, a unique case of lower pons, cavernous angioma. And in this time, we use a pre-sigmoid and sometimes maybe also pre, uh, retro-sigmoid can find. You can see here, there's a young lady with a very big, with a hematoma ultimate inside. You can see here in the lower point. Then we open it here, you can see, we can use like just as a CPA approach. After leaking the CSF, you can see here, lower cranial nerve, seven and eight complex are here. Then we can see, just look, where the color is different. You can see here the color is a bit brownish. I mean beneath this like a hematoma of the cavernoma. So we can see that, okay, then we can, we can decide there is the best entrance, means that the more superficial entrance. You can see that after that, it's just a uh, light hematoma uh, coming out, then we can remove totally uh, this cavernoma located in the lower pons uh, location. And the patient gets soon better when she came to me with a hemiplegia. And then soon uh, recover. And three months later, she walked with me in my clinic. You can see that's before and that's after surgery. So this is the lower pons, carpenos, and geoma. So this is uh, another unique case with a 29-year-old female with a bilateral paralysis and a palsy. This is a huge... Uh, uh, cavernous angioma located from the midbrain going to the pons. So what is the, the best approach for this? Because this question. So the, uh, <coughs> the cavernoma is really very big. So this time you see that it's very big from the pons going to the midbrain. It's quite huge. Yeah? That's the husband met me. So in this case, we decided to use like a sitting position uh, because sitting position may be the best approach to the, this type. So again, the sitting position, of course, we need to be very careful, right? We need also to understand the risk of the sitting position. We need to have a very good anesthesiologist because they need to monitor uh, the ECG, be careful about the air emboli, it may happen quite frequently in the sitting position. But with uh, this sitting position, we know that all collapse down, right? The cerebellum is down, you can see very clearly without any retraction. You can see here, right? So, well, of course, operator is quite tired because the position, but you see that. Then we go there, we can see the, uh, deep uh, in the about androlateral. We can see, and this position really, you see, there's cerebellum going down and then we can have a very good uh, surgical field around there right this is the position is really very useful for the huge one 
the Kavanoma located in the midbrain pond location. You can see that, right? Uh, so it's very good because of crawling down. You can see that you can find this is the Kavanoma. And then again, because of course, manipulation will quite a lot because the, uh, because the volume is so big. But again, with this position, then we can go in, it's quite nice. So again, we can do total removal after this position, sitting position. <clears throat> so this is the pause stop and the lady still came to me uh, walking and uh, with a mild paresis. This is not the case with a 60 years female with unconscious, unable to swallow and any paresis. You can see here, and this is also located in the medulla. <clears throat> in the middle. So we need to open like this posterior approach and you need to understand you can see here this is a cyphical cord here then we need to know where is the cavernoma located because it's not appeared from the Two minutes, Eka. Yeah, Sure, almost. So we just incise in the anterolateral and we found this is the cavernoma and uh, the lady against the use took even before before surgery, already with the tube. But fortunately, the lady, two months also used tube and now can eat thing normal. So again, uh, be careful. Manipulation in the medulla is completely different story with manipulation in the pounds. Because again, uh, very small and very compact with nuclear over there. So thank you very much for your attention and have a Good night, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Eka. It was great. And uh, thanks for keeping the time. So we are done with the lectures. And uh, what I need to do is to thank all the participants, because without you, it would be pointless to organize something like that. Then I would like to thank all the faculty, which I see now is uh, present, all of them. And uh, above all, I must thank uh, Professor uh, Imad Kanan, who was the driving force behind this all, and uh, to him belongs all the credit for this uh, extraordinary course. And this course will certainly be sending out evaluations, which uh, those registered will receive within 24 hours. And we would like you to fill the form. It's uh, five minutes work. Send it back to us. And within seven days, all the registered participants will receive uh, diplomas, which are very nice and very elegant, thanks to Pablo, who, who did them. So thanks again. We hope to organize the uh, next seminar in June. So hopefully you will all join again. And uh, we believe that we shall prepare a nice program. And now that I see that uh, Professor Kanan is uh, present, uh, Imad, would you like to conclude the uh, uh, think no, for actually, you, you've done you. the job, and we are co-chairing this uh, committee. We are, as faculty, very pleased of the number of attendees that exceed uh, 4,000 registrants, and this is, I think, one of the largest ever. And uh, with this uh, expected feedback coming, we are for sure will have the dynamic course coming again in June. And uh, we will, of course, with the different topics and uh, uh, additional uh, staffing. I thank everybody as well. Thanks, Vladimir. Thank I you. have to add, the please, uh, to Pablo, who was an important part of this course, to Sanjeeva, who has uh, given us the support and the initiative as well, and all the faculties. Thank you. Imad. Imad. Yes. Can I can I ask everyone to smile because I want to take a group picture in the lobby? <laughs> lobby. <laughs> what about the dinner, Pablo? Yes. My well, I, I received a, a message on the phone from uh, Giovanni. He said the next meeting will be in Ecuador. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm preparing myself for avoid the social distancing and. Um, jump on the flight. Let's hope the best and pray for everybody that they'll be safe and able to rejoin these activities in, in our traditional way as well. Sure. This is a good way. Fantastic.
All of us are very good. Bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now, next, us, next, thank next you. time, next time it will be Victoria Falls. Yeah. Very good. Hi, Salman. Hi, see you guys. Yeah, you must Hi. organize it in uh, Harare again. Sam, yes, Sam, no, Sam, Victoria Sam, Falls this time. Victoria yeah. Falls. Bye -bye, guys. Yes, for sure. With yeah. one guest. We have yes. the key. Uh, the uh, key uh, is waiting for us in Pakistan. Sure. <laughs> has to pay everything. Yes, of course. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big and Mexico, of course. Mexico is yeah. a full right. program. <laughs> hey. Canada in the Thanks summer everybody. is not so bad. We'll see what we can do for me. Do not yes. forget. Come here, Jack. Okay. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. See, see you soon. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Miguel Ángel, muchas gracias. Congratulations. Gracias, Pablo, fantástico. Thank you so much. <laughs> nos vemos, nos Ramis, vemos pronto. Good to have you with us, Ramis. Take care. And Tanji, yeah. are you with us? Or I think Tanji is too late for him in China. Must be after hours. Okay. They might be sleeping. Hope we will have him the next time with us on the as a presenter. Ramesh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye, Matt. Bye bye. bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Hola, hola. No video. No video. Yes, video. Sanjiva, I just stopped the recording and it's